We're good? All right. Thank you. Um, so uh, opening the meeting of the Rock, Montpelier Roxbury Board of School Directors at 436, got a long agenda. I first want to welcome Miriam a lot to the board and to a new school year. I welcome everyone to a new school year. I was like, you've got off to a great start. I'm very excited to have both of you on the board, and this will be um, this will be a marathon indoctrination because our meetings are usually not this long, uh, and we've got some some meaty stuff. So um, excited to have you on the board, and excited to have your uh, participation and your thoughts and perspectives. So thank you for for doing this. I know it's a big commitment, and I'm sure you'll do a great job of helping voice to your students because that's really important to all of our decisions and. Uh, this is a super important role. So thank you both for stepping up. Uh, and then, Scott, I just want to make sure we have your needs taken care of. Are you planning to come in and just on remotely, or should we be checking with you remotely for the whole meeting? Because I know sometimes you get lost in space. I'm uh, driving to Boston right now and could think of no oh, better so way to keep my eyes open than um, participate virtually. All right, perfect. I will uh, I will check in on you every now and then to make sure that you're not um, getting lost from the conversation. Um, excellent. So first order of business is public comment. Uh, you know, public comment is for the purpose of providing the public an opportunity to um, bring issues to the board to comment on matters that are either on the agenda or not on the agenda. Um, and uh, we do not respond in real time, but the uh, the information you bring us is, is very, very important. Uh, and we also recognize that it can be uh, difficult to come before the board. A lot of times people come with matters that are, uh, you know, involve their kids or themselves. Um, and we really appreciate, uh, you know, the perspective and sometimes the courage it takes to come up and, and speak to the board. Uh, and if we do not respond in real time, that is just our uh, procedure. Um, but we do listen, and it does have a big impact on our decision making. Uh, so with that, I will open up to public comment. If you wish to speak, please come to the front of the room. Uh, so we have two. I will, yes, the person who's already up. Uh, and then Lisa. Hi there. Um, my heart is really racing right now. My name is Stephanie Delina, and recently I submitted my re resignation. Before August 18th, it was the most unprofessional thing that I could imagine doing. The other unprofessional thing would be the abuse of power by leadership. And I hope that people who also want to speak will give me the time to read my letter of resignation. And that is to say, my colleagues and my community I've worked with and loved and served for 30 years. Here's my 30 year pin I was given in June. They don't know why I resigned and I want them to understand why I resigned. So thank you for indulging me. Dated August 18th. Dear school board chairman, Jim Murphy, I am Stephanie Delina. I began my career in education in the state of Vermont in 1987, teaching grades seven and eight, language arts at Castleton Village School in Castleton, Vermont. What a wonderful new teacher adventure. One in which I learned along with my students, and that is a theme. In 1993, with a desire to return to central Vermont where my family lived, I applied for and was chosen from an application pool of over 100 to assume the position of eighth grade language arts at Main Street Middle School. I thrived in my new role in this progressive, always on the cutting edge setting and learned along with my students. In 20, 2003, when I felt the tug for professional change, I earned my master's degree in education through St. Michael's College. My thesis was about how to teach math at the middle school level in developmentally responsive ways. And I transitioned to a decade long position a sixth grade math and language arts teacher. I learned along with my students. When again, the desire to remain fresh and engaged in my work pulled at me, I transferred to Montpelier High School, assuming what was my current role as flexible pathways advisor. 
The passing of Act 77 and personalization, relevant, meaningful learning inspired me in new ways. Working to connect students with non-traditional educational opportunities beyond the walls of a classroom, I learned along with my students. As I write this, a not typical resignation letter, please know that I'm very, very proud of the teaching and learning accomplished during my career. And I am as stunned as anyone regarding its sudden closure. Having now introduced myself to you, join me in a review of my last several months as a veteran teacher in this district. On April 21st, I completed my discretionary days form in hard copy. Discretionary days for anyone who doesn't know are two days. We teachers must work outside of the other calendar days. Every teacher I know and love and myself work far more than two work days beyond the calendar. I used the MRPS current calendar hanging on my classroom bulletin board for reference. The form was due by April 30th and with joint replacement surgery scheduled in the last month of school, I put no tasks off. I delivered the form to Val Belanger. I emphasize here, due to the nature of my work, I very often work outside of the school day, schedule a Monday through Friday framework and I definitely must work over vacations. I get to know, monitor, support, communicate with and about dual enrollment and early college students. I do the same for high school level online learners. Colleges and our online course providers, academic calendars do not align with our schools. And it has been my pleasure and my privilege to not miss a beat along with my students. The patterns of my work are well known by me. The form is not complicated to complete. I considered this professional responsibility taken care of, and I even shared the relief of this with a colleague, sweating to get his done on June 14th, when he asked me if I needed to do the same. I'm so glad I did that a long time ago, I reflected, so I can just stay focused on my work. On the last day of school, June 15th, Superintendent Bone Steel presented me with my 30-year MRPS pin. It's a service award. I was in the auditorium with my peers. I admit the standing ovation was the result of timing. My award coming on the heels of another celebrant of a milestone that afternoon, but it was humbling nonetheless. I took a photo of my pin and the monetary gift notice and I sent it to my husband and my daughter who is now in this profession. Despite the blessing of an early day release to all by the superintendent, that day, I stayed in my classroom until approximately four o'clock. I share this specifically so you will know that if either Superintendent Bonesteel or Principal Gingold had wanted to talk with me, I was on site. No one stopped by and when finished, I closed my classroom door behind me, anticipating the restoration, relaxation and rejuvenation the summer months would bring. The following week, when I received my first summer payroll receipt, I noticed that the $500 service award was on it. Also, right below that, $738.20 had been deducted from my pay. I had no idea why. I lost nearly the whole day chasing down what this was, why this was, how this was, essentially with no prior communication or conversation with me. Superintendent Bone Steel directed our payroll employee to dock my pay for the two discretionary days. In a response, an email response to me, Principal Gingold feigned ignorance and empathy, saying, I understand the situation could be very stressful. I'm sorry, and I appreciate your patience. There was no ownership on Principal Gingold's part. I was told that Val was on vacation for two weeks, Libby for three weeks. I was sent by Mr. Gingold on a goose chase to talk with Anna Hipko, Superintendent Bone Steel's administrative assistant. When I did catch Anna in her office, because I was here on Friday, proctoring an adult online learner's final exam. The day after school got out, I was here. Anna turned to me and she sent me right back in the direction of those responsible, the superintendent, my building principal, his administrative assistant. Being treated, mistreated 
in this way by people in leadership positions, and in the case of Val, by a person I have trusted, cared about, and worked for for almost 10 years, caused mental and emotional anguish I cannot adequately, adequately describe. Digging in my perennial garden, riding my horse, walking my dogs in the woods, swimming in my pond, lying in bed at night. No matter where I was or what I was doing, the pain gripped my mind and my heart, and my passion for teaching was stolen one day at a time. Superintendent Bone Steel met with the union representatives on August 10th, 2023, nearly two months after the action was taken. I was informed of the following agreed upon outcomes of that meeting. They are enumerated here as they were shared by me, shared with me. One, Libby acknowledged that you were not on the reminder email sent to all whose discretionary day forms were missing on June 14th. And that it is possible that your form that you recall delivering to Val was misplaced. Two, given the discrepancy around number one, your pay will be restored if you submit a new discretionary day form. Three, she agreed to implement a more streamlined system for documenting discretionary days that will allow for more ownership by the faculty member for submission purposes. Four, in the future, she will schedule a face-to-face -face meeting with folks with a union representative present to inform them that they are subject to disciplinary action if they do not submit the paperwork. In closing, I reiterate that I am very, very proud of the many ways in which I touched the lives of Montpelier's children and they mine. I was not ready to retire. I did not do so when eligible in June of 2022, did not accept the buyout offer from a little less than a year ago. And I looked forward to another year of service. However, I believe, and I believe this district believes that who we are reveals itself when no one is watching. Superintendent Bone Steel, Principal Gingold, Val Belanger harmed me badly in a situation where one question would have made all the difference. Steph, we don't have your discretionary day form. Can you tell me about that? I will not work for or with those who operate in secret and fail to communicate, knowing another human being will be crushed as a result. Take care of yourself. Take care of each other. Take care of the place. Three imperative sentences printed on most high school, Montpelier High School related items. Administrators use them in letters, in assemblies that open school years, or to address the school community in challenging times. A plaque with them is set in stone between the parking lot and the main entrance. For me, the hypocrisy is overwhelming. Who took care of me? Time is a very, very special thing. Those who devalued me, disrespected me, underappreciated me, hurt me, and acknowledged my 30 year commitment to this district and 36 years in the state of Vermont as a public school teacher, publicly with a smile, while slyly directing payroll to slap me with a never before experienced deduction for professional responsibility I had in fact fulfilled. They will not be benefactors of one more minute of my time. My time will now be spent at my discretion, period. I have discussed my immediate retirement with the Vermont State Retirement System, and I am considering legal counsel on this matter. Respectfully, Stephanie J. Delina, formerly Flexible Pathways Advisor on Pleasure High School. And thank you for your time. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you for your 30 years. Sorry, the. My name is Lisa Burns, and I want to thank Stephanie. She is the only reason my daughter survived COVID at this high school. And you have my and her eternal gratitude, and I'm very sorry what this happened. I came here to speak today because there are two new school board members here. And you have a lot of responsibility and a lot of potential. And there will be amongst, I think, some of these people sitting here, an, a, another school board member that will be joining you today. And I would like to ask you specifically to take this job very seriously. 
because the adults in the room, all of us, myself included, have failed you. We have told you, this school board has told you that you suffered no academic loss from the year and a half where your education was impacted by COVID. And by doing that, they absolve themselves of the responsibility of addressing your academic loss. They have said that your decreased scores on all standardized tests are because you don't try anymore. And actually they suggest that it is throughout the grades from second grade through 12th that students do not care about formalized testing and therefore the results are suboptimal. And this board has spent its summer discussing how they can address this um, and search for ways, other metrics, other things they can judge to why you all, um, unlike the 78 other school districts in Vermont, not one of them, I, I researched this, I could not find a single other school district that claimed their students suffered no academic loss. Nor is there any other of the 78 school districts that continues to say there was no loss. That is one thing that they will be discussing, that you will be discussing in this meeting later today. Please keep that in mind, you deserve better. Another thing they will be discussing are the facilities here and their uh, uh, request for a proposal to get a committee or a group, a, a consultant to help them look into our facilities. And once again, the adults in the room have failed you because we have brought us to this point of climate crisis. And I think you all know your generation, your people, your fellow students know that we have failed you and this idea of placing a track anywhere on this area or maintaining and putting money into a building that is in a floodplain is ridiculous. Additionally, they have finally, as long as they have been working at this, which is over three years, come to the point of coming up with a non-binding net zero resolution at the same time that they wanted to spend $2 million on a track. So I would say you need to be very cautious with what they are telling you and stand up. You as representatives of not just the high school, but all the students can do better than what they tell you as a division three soccer finalist or champion. Your leadership can do better than reinstituting pep rallies and organizing uh, school-wide social events. Stand up, it's hard work, and it's so sad that I have to ask you to do this, but these people desperately need your help. And ask your fellow students to help you to help them. Thank you. Hey folks, Jim Mike and Mary, parent of a track uh, student athlete. Uh, a little surprised to be here again. I don't follow uh, Front Porch Forum, so I didn't know that there was all sorts of hubbub out there in the world. Um, so, yeah, probably. Um, so I'll try to try to be pithy here. Um, um, so first off, um, I'm grateful for the excellent facilities that we have. And I feel like all the meetings I've attended the past year show a really great focus on our community, on maintaining excellent facilities here at the school. I'm very impressed with Andrew LaRosa and all the hard work that he puts in, especially with the Facilities and Energy Committee. Um, I haven't seen anything track related on the Facilities and Energy Committee. So that's why I was a little surprised track stuff came up. Um, the track is the exception uh, in maintaining excellent facilities at the school. We all know it's been neglected for uh, decades and the you know board unanimously approved not that long ago to dedicate some funds to make up for that to get us in a great space. Um, so I hope that we stay on track with that and don't forget all of the people that came and testified in support of that, which is a very significant portion of our community. 
Two, speaking of floodplains, um, I'll tell my credentials a little bit. I'm a natural resource professional. I deal with permitting and floodplains on an annual basis and have for the past 10 years. When you're in a FEMA floodplain or FEMA floodway, a lot of things depend on what is your current use and then what are anticipated uses. And the main thing engineers care about and FEMA cares about is if you're going to cause a greater than one foot increase in the uh, base flood elevation within a floodway. And so maintaining a track as a current use and as a slightly improved facility isn't going to be like building a Walmart there that could have an impact on downstream communities and their flooding. So I see it as a very appropriate use as a flood in a floodplain where it's already a current allowed use, as with the existing fields. It's the kind of thing that could withstand flooding. It's the reality of where we are. There's a lot of embedded energy in all of our facilities here, and there are ways to do better work to floodproof them. I believe it is unrealistic to move our facilities. And I think it makes sense to invest in them and to make them more resilient to future climate change challenges. Uh, three, there's talks out there about a you know potential merger with U32 and everything like that. There's been talks about that for decades. There could be talks in the future. I'd say if we manage it and merge with U32 tomorrow, it still would make sense to have a track here for the uh, middle school who would likely use it, for the PE classes, for the community, I see great benefit in having a track improved at this facility. Hasn't changed, as I've shared. Prior testimony, I was almost in tears at times with the track teams coming in here. They had U32 track supporting them. The sheer number of students who support this, who want this, who know that it will benefit them uh, is significant. And I spoke to my son and I asked him, why do you think it would be good to have a track? And he went right to social emotional learning, which is where the current metrics that you have available show that we have had deficits since COVID in social emotional learning. A lot of benefits to be shared. The principal gave a good talk last meeting that I was at, talking about all the benefits of that. I think that is just as valid as it was before. Um, and big picture, I think, is, you know, there's a lot of discussion these days about intention and impact. And I understand there could be lots of great intentions for unassigning the funds, setting them aside for more rainy day stuff. But I think the impact of that will be significant to our students. I think all the testimony you heard from students especially is still valid. And I would like you to hold on to that into your minds as you have this discussion today. Um, and thanks again for your service. Great, thank you. Good. Looks like we have someone on, oh, Jim? Hello, uh, James Ray. Um, I want to first welcome, join Jim in welcoming you two to the school board. What an inspiration to have to from the high school community on the board. Um, and I wouldn't normally have directed it to you all specifically, but since that that can has been opened, I want to perhaps warm up the environment a little for you. <laughs> Um, you join a public service tradition in the state that is phenomenal. Um, my father served in the Indiana State Legislature, and his proudest moments in that legislature were when he would come home and say, you fight the idea, never the person. And he was a Republican. I, I'm, I, I fell Democrat. doesn't matter. His point was we would argue in the well of the Senate all day long, and then we would go have a drink together. We would have dinner together. And that's how we got things done because we did not cross the line of attacking people and attacking. And you have here in, I'll come back to Vermont. We have here in Vermont that same wonderful tradition. We have a governor who will have no problems in today's political climate standing shoulder to shoulder with Bernie Sanders or Patrick Leahy or Peter Welch and giving them all due credit for things that they've accomplished at the, at the national level for our state. And vice versa, you have Bernie Sanders and Peter Welch standing arm in arm with, with our Republican governor doing the exact same thing. Um, I ha have seen that. I think that filters down to this board. You have a we, we have a, a superintendent who I think is, is like an incredible, hardworking, fair, honest person and a school board that is very much the same. Um, and so I, I welcome you to that, th this incredible tradition in Vermont. Uh, that that's beyond Vermont, but I think it's special here, and I've really noticed it over the years. And uh, I, I I hope you enjoy that. Um, and I hope you know. And now to the to the whole school board, I hope you know that um, 
you know, we to be certain, we face a lot of issues now before the flood, before climate change got ratcheted up a few notches in our in our um, in our view scope here. Um, not that it shouldn't have before, but it, but it has now. And, and we face some really tough issues. Um, but I, I dearly hope that our community respects that tradition of challenging the issue and never the people that hasn't always been obvious in recent history. Um, and and I, I call on the community to, to respect that tradition and to respect the people who have shown up here to serve yourselves included all of you. Um, and I call, uh, what was my next, <laughs> excuse me. Um, oh, just to know that as these discussions continue, and this is I'm, I'm for you and everyone here, um, you know, the the silent majority. It's it's not everyone who is going to be on, on Front Porch Forum and other, other social media sites or elsewhere, uh, turning up the heat, boiling the water, and and, and making noise. Um, and, and that's everyone's right to do that. But there are many, many, many other people for any number of reasons who aren't doing that, who we don't know where they stand. And I think to make assumptions on where people stand and, and assign numbers to support the things without knowing where those people stand is is unfortunate. And so I guess my point to the school board and to you two is as, as these issues come forward, please know that that the noise that you are most likely to hear probably doesn't represent the bulk of the community. And please know that speaking as a parent, we as parents of students in the school have your back. And, and we have the back of you students who whatever changes may need to come short or long term, um, that we will ensure that you all get to enjoy quality facilities, wonderful facilities and an incredible learning environment throughout. I apologize for going on so long. Um, but there it is. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Anyone else in the room? Well, we've got looks like at least one person on phone. And if you want to raise your hand, either. Uh, yeah, yeah, I see. I see Ms. Jones. And if anyone else wants to raise their hand, they can do it. They can do it virtually. But um, it's like Devorah Jones. Take yourself off mute, please. Looks like looks like you're muted on your end. Okay, now you can hear me. Yep, we can hear you now. Thank you. Okay, great. So I'm just this is the okay. first time I'm at a school. Oh, Devorah okay. Jonas, uh, Mount Failure, Loomis Street, if that matters. Um, so this is the first time I'm at a school board meeting and I've been reading the things on front page forum, but also I'm living in it city that's been devastated by a flood and i'm confused about why we would want to spend two million dollars on a track when there are, seems to me there are a lot more urgent things that we need to do like maybe fixing the water pressure or so that our streets aren't constantly clogged things of that sort I, I, yeah, I mean, it, not that it wouldn't be nice to have a new track, but it, it feels to me like there are things that are more critical right now. That's all. Great. Thank you, Devorah. And I do just want to clarify because of this confusion. Now, the district money is not city money. So, mm -hmm. um, so even if money from the district gets repurposed, it can't get repurposed for, for instance, a city infrastructure project. Um, it looks like that is all for public comment. Um, next, we have consent agenda. Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? I move to approve the consent agenda. Do I have a second? I second. All those. Oh, any discussion? I had a couple questions on the budget timeline. Okay. On there, it says that September 6th is the day that we are setting budget priorities and guidelines, but that's not really what we're doing today, is it? No. no. Yeah. Well, so, we're setting priority Priorities. goals, goals that we could use for the budget. Mm -hmm. I think that's how Christina interpreted it. Okay. Okay. Um, 
We can revamp that language, but I think that's just how she interpreted today's agenda. Got with it. Goal plan with the goals. Okay. I have to ask Jim if he can answer it. I it's been really hard to hear, at least you too. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Apparently, I told, I said to Mia that I'm assuming that's how Christina, can you hear me out? Uh, I'm assuming that's how Christina interpreted tonight's with goals with her business manager mindset that she's thinking goals and priorities are the same thing. Yeah, no, thank you for the reminder. That's right. Good. Right, we'll try to, I know my I voice. I turn it off, but <laughs> my, my voice projects pretty well, but uh, I'll make sure to. I think it's this fan. I think it's a fan right behind right me. Behind us. Yeah. yeah, thank right. you. Um, Okay, thank you for that clarification. Uh, well, I, had, I had an idea yeah. that maybe yeah. there's a public forum on the 3rd of January, I think, in the timeline. Yep. And I wondered if maybe we could bump that earlier so that we could get our get community feedback on the initial budget. And then we wouldn't maybe have the forum on the on January 3rd. That's in statute. The forum on the 3rd yeah. is yeah. in statute. I yeah. see. Okay. So that's a requirement by law. Okay. Could we also do one that is a little bit earlier in the process to get some feedback on an initial budget? Because I know in years past, by the time we have that forum, it's pretty well finished. I mean, what we've done in the past is we've kind of been part of the planning, try to actually go out to groups and get feedback and then try to get as many people to come into the... Yeah, because the meetings are basically public forums on the budget. When we, right. We the so priorities. remember what's not in, sorry yeah. to interrupt you, well, I'm not sure um, December 6th is the initial budget presentation. Right. Then the board hears a presentation of the budget until you vote to approve it. So you have two more presentations Okay. of the budget, which of course are public right. meetings. Right. Right. Yep. Um, and that's just not written on this page, but you'll have, because we present the initial one, right. you ask questions of us, we go back and revise, we continue to get numbers to come in, like real numbers, yep. not um, the estimated guesses, number. Not the guesses, yeah, yeah, right, yeah. right. And so those, you have three opportunities in public meeting Okay, to look at that. And, and what we could do is we could either like maybe move one or two of those meetings like a little earlier or, to, or maybe schedule at a slightly different time to give different windows for people to come in. We could move one of them into the cafeteria so yeah. we have more space. So I think we could probably play with our our board meetings and make it more like a public forum. I think that's a good idea. Yeah. You and can that's also a good move public, I'm sorry to interrupt you know, guys, you can also move public comment after the presentation so people can comment yeah. Yeah. on the budget. I think we should, yeah, let's should. Yeah. Let's keep all that in mind. Okay. Okay. Perfect. I agree with Mia though. It might be nice to like actually put it as a date here because this is the public facing document um, that people in the community are seeing. So we may understand that there's going to be two public meetings in which the public can come and speak to us about the proposed budget, but it, without it being like listed here as one of the options. I mean, I suggest doing that on the 15th to have the initial presentation to us so we can kind of digest it, then we can maybe kind of communicate out like the top three or four things it's doing to, you know, let the public know a little more about what the budget is and then maybe have the 15th be kind of advertised as a, you know, a meeting slash public forum on the budget. Well, where we'll get the second presentation with some of our initial feedback folded in, we'll have some time to communicate out what we've seen and then we can you know, get feedback then. Does that make sense? Yeah, it should be the 20th. The 20th? The 20th okay. It's the second. You can hurt to put something there too, like host, hosting oh. public forums, you know, because okay. we, yeah. we will go out to the senior center or to the parents' groups and uh, neighborhood, yeah. so, neighborhood gatherings. So I do want to see, like, I'm looking at our 23, 24 year at a glance calendar, and Christina did it just slightly differently this year than what Grant has typically done it in the past. So on the 23, 24 year at a glance forward calendar, Jill, can you hear me over there? Am I talking about them? Yeah. All right. It ha we have a public budget form on the 3rd of January, but right. we can certainly move that to the 20th of December instead. It's so it's okay to move it. It just has to happen. That's the thing that's in statute. No. Oh. Oh, I see what you're saying. I'm sorry. I totally told you the wrong information. I was thinking about the 
right before town meeting is in the statute. I'm that's sorry. The one. I'm okay. sorry. That okay. Was, yeah. I'm sorry. That's no, that's okay. Fault. That's okay. So yeah, the the for the third would be the public public forum. I totally messed and up. And what we right could there. do and what we could do is have that on the fifth the twentieth instead. Could, yeah. 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 And we could say we're doing like Jim said, after the initial budget presentation on the sixth, we could open up public comment after, after yeah. that presentation. I, I say we have public comment after all the presentations. Could is there a reason why we wouldn't sort of list it also on you mentioned November fifteenth, Jim? What was the reason not to December there's not a meeting on there, the yeah no I, I misread that that's the uh looks like that's what I'm getting that's a different state yeah but we have a school board meeting on the 15th no the 6th and the 20th we have a school board meeting have no I mean meeting. November oh sorry I was looking at December November we won't be doing public budget presentation we won't have the budget but we, but could we get elicit feedback on priorities you know earlier sure. Yeah. Um, so that it could potentially impact the budget. On the 23-24 year at a glance, the on the 20th of September, I just kind of roll this over from year to year. Yeah. And on the 20th of September, that that board meeting, that typical board meeting, is planning community outreach for budget presentation. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this isn't an official document, your calendar, is it? No, I just want to tell you what we have done in years past. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know that it necessarily has to be changed or anything, but just mm -hmm. for future reference, it might be nice to plug in some dates for community feedback so that the public knows when to be paying attention. Yeah, excellent. Further comments or questions, we can adjust the schedule accordingly. I'm, that's all I've got. It. Thank you. No. Um, so, with those suggestions uh, concluded, we have a motion to approve the consent agenda. Or, not a motion, but I, everyone in favor. Sorry. Aye. It's been a while. Uh, and no one opposed. Great. Um, so next is new board candidates, and we have uh, three, and there's only one I recognize by face. So, um, so now just uh, we all got your letters of interest. Um, for one, thanks to everyone for being interested. Uh, yeah, we really appreciate the people who are willing to kind of step up and and take responsibility. It's it's uh, you know it's it's a fair amount of time and. Um, not a lot of compensation for it, uh, but it's definitely very important work. Uh, and uh, we appreciate everyone who's willing to to put themselves in the role of of decision maker. It's you know, as you've seen probably with some recent decisions, you know, a lot of people have very different opinions and and it's it's tough to muddle through and it's uh, um, yeah, it, it takes a little courage to put yourself in a position of responsibility and, and service. and we really appreciate all three of you for being willing to step up. Um, and and express interest. Uh, and unfortunately, we're only going to be able to choose one of you, and all three of you look fantastic. Uh, and I also just at the beginning, uh, for anyone who who doesn't get it, we have we have elections every March, and and we're always looking for uh, community members who are are willing to to step up and and serve and put themselves in in this role. Uh, so so thank you, and and uh, uh, you know unfortunately we we'll won't be able to take one of you. Um, with that. Uh, I don't know which order you want to go in. We have uh, two Tims and a Jake. Uh, so um, uh, whoever wants to step up first, just you know, uh, come up. Um, you know, let us let us know your interest, and uh, you know, we might ask a few questions, and then then we'll go into executive session and make a decision. Uh, you're you're willing to stick around for the rest of the meeting. Uh, you won't be able to formally serve even after appointed until you get sworn in. Uh, at City Hall by uh, John Odom, or and you can do that by phone too. Um, but you're certainly welcome to participate in the rest of the meeting. Um, and once you're appointed, once you get sworn in, you you will have uh, you will be official. Um, May I just add, City Hall is on the second floor of the Senior Center. Yes, it's oh, not yes. at City Hall. Oh, that's right. Oh, yeah. So by phone might be easiest. Uh, 
Um, why don't we just go front to back? Great. Thanks, everybody. Uh, Jake Feldman, uh, resident of Montpelier. And um, I sent you guys a letter today expressing my interest. Um, and, you know, there's some wonky stuff in there. Um, but before I talk about that, um, I should mention that um, I did my internship here in this building. Um, I taught with Sue Beam, um, Advanced Placement Statistics, Advanced Algebra 2, and an entry-level uh, high school math class. Um, it was wonderful. That was in 2010. Um, I sat in this very room with Principal Peter Evans, um, giving us lots of great information. Um, so I was a teacher. Um, after that, I taught in, in Hardwick at Hazen Union for two years. Um, it was super challenging. Um, the, you know, I, I, I have like an insane amount of respect for teachers and they bring so much value to the community, um, that, you know, I think that they're strangely undervalued, to be honest. Um, I think a great teacher is an incredible thing and, and we should do everything we can to, to make them comfortable and happy. Um, so that's, that's some of my teaching experience, um, I lived in Montpelier for 18 years. Um, before that, I lived in the Northeast Kingdom. Before that, I went to Middlebury College, um, major in economics. I have a master's degree in statistics from UVM. Um, at the tax department, I, uh, which is where I work with Jill, um, I work on education funding. So um, I'm, I'm, I know a lot about from budget to people's bills. Um, I have that down pretty solid, but I don't know much about budget development. Um, I don't really know much about the work of a school board. Um, I'm very interested in learning. Um, and and so this shorter term through March would be, I think, a really good way for me to get some exposure. Um, and I think that there is some value that I could add um, based on what I know from my job. Um, I have a six-year-old son who goes to Union. He loves it. Um, it's a great school. We're so fortunate to have the teachers that we've had. Um, and, um, yeah, I appreciate the work that you guys do. I know it's incredibly hard. Um, and, um, yeah, that's my, that's my spiel. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, oh, so sorry. Jake, um, thank you for that. I'm curious to know what you estimate to be the time commitment. Like, what's your understanding of it? Not what, not what can you do, but you know, just what, what do you think it is? Um, I did look at your your um, your board meeting schedule. Is it a couple times a month? Mm -hmm. um, and our board meeting is usually two hours long, but this one is four probably. hours. Yeah. Um, and so I, I think that's probably the baseline, and then there's special committees that form and they probably have work outside of that. So um, I think it should be fine. Um, and, you know, I do with my son now older, I have a little bit more time. You know, some of you probably know with a very young kid, you know, time can get really super squeezed, but um, he's in a space now where where we have a little bit more availability. We're getting more sleep, amazingly. <laughs> so, so yeah, um, so I do have the time and um, yeah. Any other questions for Jake? Great, thank you. We really appreciate your interest. Um, hello, everyone. Um, thanks for having me here again. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I, I'm Tim Favorite. I've been a resident of Montpelier since 2014 or so. Um, I've also been a member of the Montpelier Energy Advisory Committee since 2021, and I've, you know, had the pleasure of working with the Facilities and Energy Committee um, uh, for about a year now, uh, working on the Net Zero Resolution. Um, got it drafted a couple of months ago, currently working on implementing it bit by bit. Um, Kristen and Emma Seiji have been a great, great group of people to work with. They've helped, helped me feel like a real member of the team. Um, so I look forward to working with them one way or another. Um, 
yeah, I've also gotten to sort of witness firsthand the, the issues uh, you all are grappling with. Um, I feel like, uh, you know, it, yeah, I'd, I'd be in a pretty good position to kind of hit the ground running uh, as, you know, yeah, as, as we go or as, after I get started. Um, other things about me, I'm a parent of a third grader and a first grader uh, at Union Elementary. Um, so, yeah, obviously pretty well vested in, in the success of you know, not only their success, but their classmates and, and the community at large. So, um, yeah, very interested in, you know, learning how to measure that success. Uh, I know that's one of the issues you're you're trying to grapple with uh, tonight, I believe. So, um, yeah, and, and other challenges uh, other besides net zero resolution. Uh, I know facilities is, uh, you know, future of facilities is, is a big hot button topic. Um, looking forward to tackling that. But, um, and, yeah, I think just uh, engaging with the community. Um, how can we, you know, make sure they they feel in the loop? Uh, feel like the like real stakeholders uh, and and the, the decisions the school district makes, the school board makes. So uh, yeah, I think I, I'm excited about the work that you do. I think um, I really appreciate everything you've done uh, and appreciate your consideration. Thank you. Excellent. Um, okay. uh, questions for Mia? Same, same question. Oh, uh, so yeah, I know you meet two, uh, twice twice a month, uh, the full board, um, the facilities and energy committee, I can speak to that experience, it's about, about once a month, and I, I believe there's two or three committees everybody gets assigned to, so yeah, probably like 10-ish 10, hours a month. Um, I think I can manage that. Uh, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Again, thanks for your interest. Hi, good evening, Tim number two, Tim Duggan. Um, I sent you a letter uh, and my resume, so I think you have a fair idea of my background. Uh, interested in serving because I have a elementary school student and a middle school student here. I feel I've become more involved in, and more sort of engaged in their academic adventure. And so I thought I'd, uh, I'd give it a shot. Um, but fortunately, I agree with Jim. I think you have three great candidates, or at least two, and um, happy to answer any questions. Two to four hours a week, Mia, is the answer to your question. Um, and yeah, I work with a lot of boards professionally, so I'm very comfortable uh, in that framework um, and uh, enjoy sort of working to forge consensus. So thank you for the opportunity. Uh, this is for number two. Thanks. Thanks, okay. thank you. Um, Again, thanks to all of you for your interest to serve. We are now going to go into executive session for the purpose of considering a new board candidate. Uh, Anna has wonderfully put in the wording for that motion. So if someone wants to make that motion, uh, it's on the agenda. Um, and I can pass it to someone if they don't have it handy. Uh, then we can, can break for executive session. Um, I move that we enter executive session for the purpose of discussing the appointment of a candidate for the vacant board member position under the provisions of Title I, Section 313A, Subsection 3 of the Vermont Statutes, the appointment of a public officer. Do I have second? Second. I need discussion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Great. We'll be back. Assembled, so we're coming back into order. Um, before I have a vote, I just want to say this was a a super hard decision in that all three of you really are about as equally qualified and amazingly qualified as we've had to fill an appointment. And um, I think we would have been thrilled to have any of you. Uh, and I think that was a consensus of the whole board, like everyone was so pleased all three of you applied and and again would have been super thrilled to have any of you serve on the board. I think for the two 
that we decided not to pick, I really encourage you to reapply when the next board member decides to open a bar or um, run in, in March, uh, you know, when, yeah, either contested or as, as an open seat. Um, we really uh, admire your service. I know um, uh, all three of you are, have fantastic backgrounds and, uh, and would be fantastic candidates. But unfortunately, we had to make one, so I'll entertain a motion to appoint that one person to the board. I don't know who wants to make it. No, I'm not by chair. I, I move to appoint Jane Feldman to this interim position until March. Do I have a second? I'll second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 So, uh, again, thank you to both Tims. We really hope to see your continued involvement. Um, you may feel lucky. Uh, but you know, thank you. We, we hope to, to see you, um, you know, uh, as you know, we've got a lot of tough issues coming up, uh, as you'll see with the rest of the meeting. Um, so definitely want your involvement as community members. And again, we do have vacancies that occur relatively periodically just because people have other things come up in their lives and sometimes can't serve at their term. So um, we will probably call on you again if we do have a vacancy and, and definitely uh, consider it in March. Uh, and Jake, you're welcome, you're welcome to stay. Um, you're welcome to, to go home. I don't know what your, your plans for the evening were. Uh, uh, you can kind of join as a community member. You're not, not official. official. I mean, you can come sit in Scott's seat if you want to. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, uh, but don't feel obligated because um, I know you, you didn't know the outcome and, and may have, have dinner plans or otherwise. Uh, and the only thing just will assign you a mentor uh, and um, you know get get uh, sworn in uh, before the next meeting so you can you can vote next time. So, uh, but thank you, thanks to all three. It was um, you know, we really appreciate the service and or the willingness to serve and. Uh, uh, and, and thank you for being willing to, to stack up and, and take a take a big job uh, with a lot of responsibility. So thank you. Um, so now we are on to uh, board business facilities. Um, I want to start this off with just kind of an update. Um, Libby and I met with uh, Megan Roy and uh, Floridia Smith uh, to talk about uh, kind of where our two districts are at. Um, as you know, they are also embarking upon a strategic planning uh, and uh, reorganization process that they're very invested in. Uh, I think a, a question they will be asking as part of that is what their district might look like as part of a larger district. Uh, oh, so Megan Roy is the superintendent of. I know who they are, but there's people that may yes. not be listening and okay. not there. Thank you, Emma. That's important. Uh, Megan Roy is the superintendent of the Washington Central Unified Union District. Okay. Um, which Everyone refers to it as U32, but it also involves you know, the elementary schools there of <coughs> Berlin, Callis, Doty, Rumney. And Western Middlesex, Callis, yeah. East Montpelier. So it's our, it's our surrounding towns, um, plus the schools within those surrounding towns. Uh, and Lynn once served on Callis' board, right? And the U32 board. And the U32 board. Um, and uh, Florida Smith is the chair of the Wash Central Board. Um, and as you know, you know, as was mentioned earlier tonight, uh, you know, topics, you know, the, the mer either closer coordination or emerging opportunities has been a conversation for decades. Uh, so we visited informally to kind of do a check in on where their district was. We know they're facing, uh, you know, facilities questions, we know they're facing questions around equalized people and declining enrollment. Um, where it came out of that conversation is uh, they are going through a 
reorganization and uh, strategic planning process that they plan to emerge in spring. Uh, they feel that there is interest potentially after that process in having a broader conversation about where our two districts are at and where the future of our two districts might be. Uh, they do not feel the time for that conversation is now. They want to go through their process first. Uh, we are also, you know, in the wake of the flood uh, and some other things, you know, looking, I think, to, to answer some facilities and other questions as well. Uh, so what we decided to do is that, that you know, I would uh, continue to stay in touch with Floor, Libby, and Megan talk regularly. Uh, and when we emerge from kind of the two processes that we have going on, one of which we're going to discuss tonight, uh, we would meet as two boards in the spring and check in and see where we're at and see what potential next steps, if any, are. Um, so I just wanted to appraise people of that. I, I know that's a potentially you know, big step, um, you know, and um, so that's kind of where we're looking. I'd love to, to get input or thoughts now and obviously as we, we move forward. So um, any any reactions or, or questions? The chocolate's still down there. It, has, it hasn't migrated yet. <laughs> <laughs> We're not discussing, right? You're not asking if we have questions around the RFP. We're just talking yeah, about I, I just conversations. Yeah, I just yeah. Give an update of where just been. Yeah, it was that in, right. in the community. Uh, and I think our two processes yeah you know, with, with the equity waiting study and I know you know Wash Central is, is facing some some financial issues and we also you know one thing that that Megan Libby floor and I agreed on is we want our districts to both be able to grow and meet the the needs of our students and and you know progressively move forward on education both from an educational perspective and also a facilities perspective to continue to be able to invest in our kids education invest in their learning uh but also invest in top-notch facilities that provide um you know the extracurricular and daily you know facilities and and um and uh grounds that they need yeah, I really appreciate it. Thank you for just keeping relationships good with our neighboring district and, you know, keeping open discussions and open minds about um, what the future holds for both districts and, and having, you know, being um, forward thinking around how do we support each other uh, if one or the other or both districts finds themselves in a situation where they're struggling in some way. And so I've always appreciated, you know, the sort of like sister schools. Um, and as my kids have gone through their district, I've learned more about how, um, you know, opportunities are available at U32 for Montpelier students and vice versa. So it, it does feel like there's a real collaborative nature there between the two districts. And so I really appreciate, um, you know, making sure that that relationship is taken care of and fostered. And so thank you for having those forward thinking conversations with them. Oh, you're welcome. And, and kind of on that, I, I just want to, you know, kind of mention how wonderful it is to have, to have great neighbors like Wash Central because, yeah. you know, one of the, you know, you know both Floor and, and Megan, I, I think, reached out to Libby and I with the flood and, and, you know, mentioned the possibility of if we weren't able to get to high school up and running, um, you know, we might be able to do something with U32 for, for temporary, you know, classrooms. So, um, you know, it's great to have two communities looking up each other. I would just also thank you for having that conversation. I'm the Montpelier Roxbury representative on the Central Vermont Career Center Board. So Flora and I serve on that board yeah. together and it serves 18 towns in Central Vermont. And we're all serving the same students and very much our one community. And, and they're very much also going to be needing a new facility for the career center and for those students, including Montpelier students and Roxbury students who go to the career center. Um, and there's challenges, right, with having physical location demands. And so I think it's great to like keep that conversation open because I do think there's some really exciting things that could be coming in the future 
for Central Vermont and serving all of those kids. And the more we're all talking, the less we're operating in silos. Yeah. Any threat? Is it reasonable to describe the, the structure of that district briefly? Is it possible to do it briefly? Are there multiple boards? Am I misunderstanding? I guess, yeah. And, and I can do it very briefly. They they merged as part of Act 46. They were, U32 was a supervisory union with its own board. And, and Lynn probably knows it better than I do. And then each of the elementary schools had their own separate board. And but board members from yeah. each board ended up on the U32 board. Yeah. So it wasn't like a totally separate board. It was just representatives from the other boards. Yeah. And there are five elementary schools that go up yeah. to sixth grade, and then they go into seventh grade at U32. Yeah. Yes. Um, I'll also say that I share, it sounds like the sentiment of Megan and Floor, that this would be something like a potential actual, like to merge two districts is not something that just happens oh, overnight. Yes. That it would be a years long conversation that needs to be done thoughtfully and with a lot of um, community input and that there would be no pending immediate action by either school district to sort of seek that out in the next couple of years, at least. Yeah, no, I mean, I think the idea is to get together and bring check in where we're at, see if it makes sense to have further conversations, exploratory conversations. Um, you know, and then, you know, it's a very complicated process. It's going to require community input from every community involved, which is, you know, all five towns around us, Montpelier, Roxbury, uh, and, you know, there's there's questions about what the facilities look like, what the education looks like. And then there's a lot of you know, questions about how how the town feel, you know, because they're, you know, um, you know it's, it's, it's a lot of of a lot of tough questions. And it would be a, a long involved community, community driven process um, with with a lot of information needed to be put out there and a lot of uh, very hard things needed to be considered. And it's not a new conversation. It is not a new idea. So the the conversation has been held by these communities, you know, in yeah. the past. And so I, as an individual board member, would be happy to hold to host a new, you know, thoughtful process to gather community input on that topic and to explore it as a possibility. But I just want to, I just want to manage expectations around sort of like a potential. Oh, you know, there's there's been people that are emailing and interested in that idea and i just want to make sure that people understand the complexity of the process and that it's not something that we would just form a committee and do next school year yeah, yeah absolutely it's right. yeah it's it's going to be very complex it requires again like all seven towns i think to be on board uh it requires both districts to be on board it requires a lot of things to work out and a lot of things to work out that people have very big feelings about um and you know it has there's a reason it's been talked about for decades and has not happened it's it's complicated and not easy uh and potentially doesn't doesn't make sense um so uh yeah but uh you know that's that's where we're at we, we felt it was worth worth exploring where we're both at and uh you know, will see where that exploration needs but it's not going to be um it's not going to be easy for uh, a snap of the fingers thing at all, nor should it. Uh, any any further comments or questions on that? And then I can tee up our facilities options. Um, so, uh, yeah, as as you know, and we haven't really had time, I think, to dig into this deeply as a as a board yet. Uh, we had a significant flood on July 10th and 11th that I think, uh, you know, exposed what we all knew was was a possibility, which was that we have a high school that was, you know, built uh, probably not super wisely at the time in a floodplain. Uh, we have a warming world that is upon us where uh, flooding events are going to be more and more frequent. Um, and, uh, you know, while, uh, you know, the school sustained a fair amount of, of expense and damage as a result of that, fortunately it was covered by insurance and we had a fantastic team 
that was able to get the school up and running so we could could open uh, if either the timing was different or quite frankly if the water was a few inches higher uh we might be in a, a very different boat uh and yeah we need to to kind of explore options going forward uh because i think i share everyone's sentiment that we want a high school that's going to be safe and sustainable uh for our students uh, we want a high school that we can invest confidently. Um, you know, we certainly don't want to be in a position where we just leave the high school as it is and say, let's not build anything because it's in a flood zone, because that's a huge disservice to our students. It's a huge disservice to our community. Uh, but we also want to be prudent about making sure that the investments we make going forward are the right ones and are sustainable in light of uh, you know, what, what climate change has in store for us and in store for the site. Um, so uh, kind of what, you know, Mia, Libby and I, and, you know, with, with some of you, you know, Kristen, you and I have talked about it as facilities uh, committee head is, you know, we need to take some time to look at what the options for the site are and make some intelligent decisions going forward. And a lot of ideas have been put out there, uh, you know, obviously, moving this building or moving the high school location is not going to be cheap at all. I mean, we're probably, you know, if, if we really want to move the high school, we're talking about probably a 25 to $40 million bond, um, kind of based on what we've seen in, in Burlington and other places. Um, that's not cheap. Uh, and then there's questions of, do we even have land for that in, in Montpelier? Like, where would that be? Uh, Montpelier is pretty small and, and pretty built. Um, you know, and, and if we keep the high school here, how do we make sure that we can invest confidently in it and that it will be uh, a building that if, you know, floods are more frequent, five to 10 years, uh, each flood is not going to shut the school down or cause millions of dollars of damage. Um, so these are like, these are tough questions or questions that obviously the whole city is asking. Uh, and, uh, you know, we need to be, you know, part of that discussion. So, uh, what we've come up with is uh, to have uh, to put up an RFP to have professional mm -hmm. consultants that are able to to drive a process and uh, crunch numbers and do research, um, help lead a community led process, because ultimately this needs to be a process that's informed by the community where ideas come from the community. Uh, it can't just be a community led process because we don't we need the expertise and we need someone to synthesize it. Uh, so to put up an RFP to a consultant to come in, to lead that community-led process, uh, to take the ideas that come in, uh, to pencil those out, to sketch them out, uh, and to put together a report that we can have hopefully sooner rather than later uh, to start informing some of the big questions we have to answer about um, you know, the future of our facilities uh, and you know how we invest in those facilities, you know, moving forward. So um, that is a uh, discussion around process. Obviously, the track has become part of that. Um, my suggestion is that we put that project up. What our options are, uh, I think you know we all voted unanimously. For that project because we felt it was a needed investment for our students um but i also feel that you know given its location you know building that that track as we proposed it without taking a good look at whether that makes sense in light of what happened on july 11th probably is unwise so i'll leave it at that and um, let folks dig in and then i think you know we have probably two motions which is whether to to you know, suspend the track uh, until that process takes place, and then also uh, whether we give approval to Libby to put the RFP out and start getting um, bids in on that. So I know that was a lot. Jill, um, I'm wondering. If I see the language that's in the agenda says unassigned, and it sounds like what we really would like to do is put on hold or defer action. Can we simply do that? Because if we re unassign fund balance, I feel like that creates uncertainty and that feels like a little bit of a knee-jerk reaction. Whereas if we are deferring action until such time as we have more information. 
We can absolutely. Okay. Yeah, I want to. Sorry, Jill, we done. Nope. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I want to second that. I had asked a question <clears throat> uh, in an email today that I didn't expect to get a response for because I sent it this afternoon. But yeah, just do we can can we put the project project on pause without unassigning the money? Just thinking about the uh, immersive process that was over weeks and months to kind of arrive at a yes for the earmarking of that funding that involved a lot of student voice and a lot of community input. So um, just not wanting to lose sight of that and seeing the value. <clears throat> I know in that process, personally, um, I became very um, convinced about the value of the track program in terms of its broad accessibility to so many kids of so many abilities and so many mindsets. <clears throat> and so I just want to keep that in mind that I, I personally still very much value the track program, the idea of an improved track, but it seems to make a lot of sense uh, to to kind of let the strategic planning process run its course before we take action on that. And I think currently as it stands, um, in the last update from Andrew LaRosa at Facilities and Energy, the thinking was the RFP would go out in December. So we would be like pausing that process, letting this pro process run its course. And I would just also like to see us not unassign um, the funds. Yeah, no, that, that makes more sense. Other thoughts? Brett? I, I I think the word unassigned is too strong a word, as Jill and uh, Kristen were just saying. I also think that um, drainage, I mean, I think that it's it, it, the, the prospect of building a school somewhere is an interesting idea. Um, it may be a 10-year project if it were to come to that, and it would probably be four years before we started the 10, you know, it, may, it might be 10 years before ground was broken and there may very well be other events. I think the the outcome in this event was for the school district, pretty like we kind of made it by the skin of our teeth in a way. I don't want to count on that happening again, but I certainly think that, um, facilities are going to want access to whatever fund balance is there, whether that is drainage for other practice fields, current fields, anything around this area. Um, and I would love to see a track. I'm 100% in favor of the track program and the idea of a, of a modern track. I think our kids deserve it. I think the community deserves it. Um, but there may be a lot of engineering work that comes along with drainage across the entire site um, that may sort of, you know, be a different way of looking at how the funds are actually used ultimately. Yeah. So the process point for tonight, are we taking each of these questions separately? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I don't have anything to add on the track question. I had more questions on the RFP. Okay. Any other questions on the track? And then we, then we can have have to, to vote on the track and move to the RFP. Uh, Emma? Yeah, I'm just going to sort of like add my voice to the chorus here, but I just, um, you know, <laughs> I don't feel any need to be, I, I don't understand any rut decision, that the decision needs to be. went without saying that we were going to pause the track and and all other capital improvements of our facilities in light of what we learned about the flood. So I didn't feel like that maybe needed to be, and maybe that was like a miscalculation on the board's part based on the feedback that we've been receiving from the public. But in my heart, it felt like, of course, we're going to like sort of take inventory of what happened during the flood and then see how to proceed forward. And so I did not have any conversations just for the record with anybody on the board who was ready to plow forward with any capital improvement projects. And in particular, nothing around the track was discussed. So I just wanna make sure that that's said for public record that, that, that the, the school board had almost no meetings through the summer because of the flood. We came back for a very brief meeting. It was not, you know, we weren't in any headspace or emotional space to be making any firm decisions. I don't think we it would be appropriate for any of us to be trying to make any firm decisions anytime soon. And I appreciate sort of 
the breathing room and the time to um, sit, step back and be thoughtful and reflective and learn from the professionals who know about engineering and field design and draining and you know what makes sense for us moving forward our basement. I mean, I was impressed to, I, I only walked on the track today for the first time since the flood. And I was really impressed to see the condition of the track. Um, there wasn't any silt. Um, it seems to be, it looks almost exactly the same as it did when I last saw it um, in the spring. So I just want to be, you know, I just feel like it's a good time to step back, take inventory. I'm fully supportive of um, hiring a consultant to sort of move us through what does what does the future look like with these and just wanted to say for the record that I don't think anybody on the board was ready to plow ahead with any capital improvement plans including the track um, I agree with what's already been said around I, I'm not sure that a vote really needs to be I wonder if a, if a vote an official vote needs to be taken tonight on the track or if the funds can just remain earmarked while we learn more. You would just, since it's on the agenda, you would just vote no. With the direction that I would, that you suspend the track project. Yeah. Yeah. But would we have to make a motion in a second all of that? Just because it's on the agenda? My understanding of action, but I would look towards our parliamentarian I don't think and we, then, I don't think we. It what did you say, Jill? It says potential. It doesn't get a second. It doesn't carry in it. Well, and it also says potential. It doesn't say. Well, it doesn't say a vote. Like yeah. a vote will be held. Uh, so you have direction. Here. Yeah, I just want to agree. Um, I was definitely wondering about how it would make sense to have any discussion about the track before we pursue the decision making process about the high school. This seems like the most logical course of action. I definitely still support the track project. I also run track, so I might not be the most unbiased person, but um, this seems logical. Thank you. Oh, yeah, sorry, Scott. I saw you earlier and then... Um... <clears throat> I've got air time if you if you want to use it. I don't know if you when you're driving. Yeah, this would work. Can you guys hear me? Yep, I can hear you loud and clear. Fantastic. Um, yeah, I I'm I appreciate that we're having the conversation about both of these issues, but but I I I think we are unnecessarily complicating um, the discussion. I think. Um, the, they're they're not the same question, right? The question about yeah, the yeah. RFP, it, I I believe we will vote on that. Um, I don't know that we need to, nor do I think we should vote on the track at this point. Um, it makes sense to get the information from the um, from as a result of the R RFP, um, and my. I guess I just don't know enough about the fund balance. At what point does the board need to take action on that? Um, and would it, would it be prudent to wait until March um, to, to get the results of the, um, of the um, study and then make decisions about any capital improvement, including the track? Thanks. Yeah. Those are good questions. We can definitely wait till March. We are not under any statutory or other obligation to uh, move on the fund balance in any sort of time sensitive manner. So, so it sounds like what I'm hearing is there is a consensus of the board to give kind of verbal direction that we want to pause the track project while we do this RFP and then revisit it when we have more information. So, you know, no bids, no RFPs going out on the track until we discuss it again and give indication otherwise, but the commitment to the to building the track remains. We just have to see if it makes sense where it is now and if there's other priorities that come up in this process that cause us to think differently. 
and maintaining the one point nine million dollars in the mark. Yeah. Hmm. But yeah. So yeah. I've heard a couple of people say it doesn't make sense to do any capital in projects, but we do have some going on, like the auditorium at UES is happening. So I just want to make sure we're not like making too many blanket statements to confuse our administrators. I'm not confused. Yeah, okay. sorry about I, I think it's I I think, in the floodplain. Yeah, okay. I, think, I think it's big, big improvements at this school. I mean, Got obviously it. routine maintenance, we're going to keep going the law and then we're going to keep well, know, that's not this capital project. Yeah. But we do have a significant number of capital projects that our community has been waiting for. Yes. And we've been talking yeah, about right. like window replacement and then yeah. the playground at UES. And and if there is reason to shift those, we should have that discussion. But that's those are not wrapped into this conversation. Yeah, I think, I just I think right now the, the existing projects at our non floodplain schools um, are, are still. Are Great. Still, thank you for uh, Yes. Yeah. No, thank you. That, that was, I just think, um, I think Jamie, you, you said this at the last meeting. Um, I think it's really important we remember that four years of high school, while it went by fast, is a lifetime when you're in high school. And every year that we continue to have uncertainty or have challenging conversations that leave a sense of uncertainty when we've come out of three years of a pandemic, then we've had a flood, the locusts will be here soon, I'm sure. I just think it's really important for um, our fire. students to know. <laughs> yeah, fire. we had a fire. I knew I was forgetting another. We had a fire too. Um, I just, you know, it's it's heartbreaking to have to sort of continue to put off some of these pieces. And um, I'm pretty sure I have on pretty good authority that the theater department also lost a lot of stuff in the flood that was in the basement. Like, I, I think. Oh, I right. But that we wouldn't not have plays this year because we've lost our theater stuff. So I just think it's really important. We still have students who are very actively experiencing high school and we do have a responsibility to like provide. We can't just put off everything because the adults are like, you know, we are thinking big picture, which we should. But I also want to make sure that we are um, still providing our students what they need and we're not just shortchanging everybody's experience indefinitely while we make these decisions. I hope that's clear, but I wanted to say that. Thank you. Yeah, and absolutely. Yeah, I think that's one of the reasons we want to get this process moving quickly so we can can have those answers because I don't think any of us want to put investments in our kids on hold for any longer than they have to be on hold. Because because you're right, Jill. I think yeah, high school is a super formative experience and uh we don't want kids waiting on things. To that end in a more immediate way. Yeah. So can we just hear? So is the track currently safe and in use, like at capacity by the middle school and high school fall track program? No, cross country. Sorry, cross country. Cross country doesn't use the track. They don't use the track. So the track is not in use for the track program currently. Currently, no. Okay. But it could be like it's in is it able to be used and accessed in its we current can condition? Create it and add the gravel back. Okay. I mean, it's not unsafe yeah. right now. Now yeah. I've walked on it. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not a runner, so yeah, I don't run on it. Yeah, <laughs> um, but people, I've seen people when I pull up at six thirty in the yeah. morning running I on it. So drafting caution tape, right? Yeah, okay. There's no need for that. Yeah. Okay. If you wanted a question from an answer about people who run track meets there, it's not inappropriate. I think answer. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, go go ahead. If it, we didn't run any track meets there this spring because the facility really wasn't safe to run all of the events that you would want to do safely from a track standpoint. And the sheer amount of volunteer energy it takes from an army of about 50 folks to try to get it ready so you could get a track meet there is really untenable. So we were able to partner with U32 a couple of times to run meets there. But that also was fraught with all sorts of issues. Yeah. So no, yeah. it's just that straight up back. Yeah. That was pre flood. Yeah. The yeah, the, the track events that were hosted by MHS and MSMS were at U32. Um, which is which was very nice of them to do so, but you only wanna you only want to borrow your neighbor's hammer so many times. Um or, but we don't need to we can use the bike path it's not urgent also i want to thank jill for that comment because 
I mean, it definitely feels really long to me right now. Um, and the lack of surety around these things is definitely a little scary. I mean, it's less scary being here and seeing the process, but I think there's definitely a sense of, we don't know where our high school is going to be in a couple of years. And that is scary. That's that's scarier than we don't know if the track's gonna get redone or not. That I mean, it would be nice, but another thing I'd want to add to the I think Kristen was may have been one of your questions, um, but it certainly has come through on form, front porch forum as well. This idea that the track is a permeable surface as it is right now, it's not a permeable surface in any way, shape, or form, and we have engineering designs to tell us that. So the idea that the board eventually would be making, taking an impermeable surface where water can flow through, ideally, and making it a, or no, I'm sorry, a permeable surface where the water can flow through and if we were to redesign it to make it that makes it imper that's just not accurate it's it is impervious not right now to water so um i just wanted to put that out there because it's been a topic of consternation i think amongst the the public and you can see where i you can see why you i had that same thought with yeah. my driveway when we did that. i was like well it's gravel driveway it's it's permeable but no yeah. no not the way not yeah. the way it's made I just want to, I don't, I don't know, because I didn't prepare to answer your, your statement that you just said about being scared about the future of the school, but, um, but I'll try to just, I, I think that the future of whatever the future holds for the students of this district, I think it will be, you know, thoughtful, a thoughtful process with only the best interest of all of the students in mind and with student input. And so I don't think anything would happen that the students weren't, you know, supportive of and welcoming of. And if something were to happen with some sort of future merger with U32, um, you know, first of all, it would take a long time. And then second of all, and there would be plenty of time for student input on that process um, to, for us to understand, for the board to understand how students really feel about the future of like a potential merger. Um, so I would only see it as like, maybe try to keep an open mind of like, if there's any conversations in the future about merging, that it would only be an opportunity to sort of explore options and not, you know, something that would be done against the will of the students, Yeah, I hope. <laughs> I understand. I think we should, Alara and I can definitely work on continuing to communicate that with the students, because I think that would be valuable for people to understand that decisions aren't being made behind closed doors by big powerful people that it's going to be a long process and that people can have it but and i feel like there has been some transparency about that like in um mr gingles like principal updates and the solo and salutes that especially at the beginning of the year which i actually kind of like to read sometimes when i'm bored <laughs> so, yeah so i i do feel like it is being communicated with the students but maybe not as much as for people who don't actively seek out resources for communication, but we can we can work on that together. It might be a good first assignment yeah. for us together to host like a student forum to yeah. discuss some of the stuff that's been bubbling up in the community. Yeah, you know, and, and we want to talk about students in this process. And I also just want to reiterate, like whatever the outcome of the process is, we will ensure that. Yeah, for each school year, they, you know, the students are in a building that is functional and meets their needs. So yeah, if we merge with U32, it would be done in a way where there'd be like a smooth transition from, you know, one year here to, you know, moving to that high school. If we build a new high school, this high school will stay functioning and up to date and usable until that new high school is ready to be, to be built. We won't, you know, we, we will make sure that, that there's not you know, a temporary situation. I mean, obviously if, if there's an event and, you know, the bill's not usable, but in terms of like planning, we'll do it. So it's it's smooth and students are getting what they need all the, every step of the way. Uh, so moving on to the, are, are we ready to discuss the RFP? Um, 
I'm assuming you've all read it. If not, we can get, I mean, it, it just basically uh, mm -hmm. asks for a community-led process, as I, I stated, with you know the consultant holding forums, uh, collecting information, uh, getting public input, and then putting a report that we would distribute to the community and also use as a discussion point to just you know discuss what our options are. And my guess is depending on what the options are, we'd probably have a community process around, you know, betting that option and, and making a decision around it. Um, did you just get darker in here? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. The sun probably wouldn't. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> you're okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was like fading. Boom. Uh, um, so and any any questions about the RFP? I think the desire is to approve it so Libby can get it started. Um, but if there's uh, edits, amendments, general discussion points, um, we can do that and we can have it um, hopefully approve it with kind of those, those line items uh, indicated so that way Libby can hopefully send it out maybe tomorrow. I just wanted to confirm that what we're looking for at the end of the process is that like recommendations from people who are have done the research on the like geographical and geological have collected the community input and and it'll be about all of our facilities, all of our buildings. It's not just focused yeah. on the high school because it's in a floodplain. And so we could have information that we could use for another question that's come up many times, which is how do we, what what should we do if anything about Roxbury Village School? We, we would potentially have information that would help us answer that question as well. Yeah, and I think it's structured. Okay. What was that then? I think it's structured that it's written that way right yeah. now. So it would be a holistic look. I mean, obviously, I think the high school would be a large focus of it because it's got a problem the other schools don't, but it, it would look holistically at you know, those other buildings. And would it also look at some of the, I guess maybe this is what would come through in the community input is that ideas that are generated from, from the community, like like merging with U32 or building a high school where the old Elks Club was, they yep. would maybe investigate those and say, here's Absolutely. here's the benefits of those and here's the downsides of those ideas. Well, they would not have the authority necessarily to talk about merger because okay. they're not working with U32. Right, with that's, good point. Central, that's right? a good point. That's a good point. Yeah, but, but I think they could, I think they could explore it as a hypothetical. Yeah, from, our yeah. from our lens, from our lens, right? From our lens, what would be benefits and downsides to Montpelier Roxbury of doing that, and other ideas like yeah. buying any of the college buildings that are left, or yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah. that's great. Yeah. That's mean, what it, we need. It would be everything like looking, what's is there available land? Yeah. If so, how much would it cost? Where is it? Um, uh, yeah, those type of questions. Who can do all of that? Architecture firms do that. They do. Okay. Yeah, especially those who um, specialize in school buildings. Uh huh. And, and the community input process. Yeah. They can, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, True X Collins just did a huge community input uh, process with Manuski to get their. They renovated, renovated a building, but Got it. Um, it was huge. Um, and also, like contractors do it too. Mm -hmm. I think we'd be veering more towards architects. Mm -hmm. But Got it. Okay. I have a question about that also. Maybe it's just implicit, and maybe architecture firms, development firms kind of, you know, have somebody in house to lead that part of the work, but that part of the work does feel really significant in terms of like we're talking about students and staff and community members. We're talking about many different groups of people. And I know right now, I think it says like up to three community sessions, community engagement sessions. And I would wonder if we want to expand on that so that we can capture kind of all of the groups that we are um, intending. Again, it's sort of like a managing expectations piece. Like if we're saying via this process, we are going to 
substantively and actively engage these groups cannot feasibly be accomplished in three community engagement sessions. Um, and maybe that's a question we ask them in some of the interviewing we do, but um, I would wonder if increasing that number would make sense given the breadth of engagement we're hoping to get. Thank you. Um, so that's a question I have and that could be, uh, and I wonder too, just in the qualifications piece, could we specifically mention, you know, that we're seeking a firm that is, has a just strong history and experience of, of doing that community engagement work and specifically naming that because it feels like it's going to be a big part of what we're hoping to get out of it. I think that if more are required, that leaves real room for for that, right? That's your first question. Do we yeah. need more? Yeah. Um. So that at least three and loose. Right. It can be beyond that. Yeah. Yeah. Um. For your second question around, should we add things for? Qualifications. If I channel my inner Andrew Larosa, <laughs> exactly. That's exactly what he would say. <laughs> yeah, he would say that people who haven't who haven't had experience with this work won't apply for this work, or that will come out in their application anyway. Right yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, and again, so the process will be, you know, if this gets approved and it goes out, it'll also come back to like facilities and energy committee folks can participate in interviews such that we can kind of ask those questions about the community engagement work. Yeah. Is that, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Were we going to think about timing? It's uh, not in there. It says the final report should be presented to the school board at their part of the public meeting on arrows. Oh, he's on. May 15th, 2024. Yeah, the last. Oh, at the bottom. Oh, I thought that was part of our discussion. Got it. Sorry, I just missed those arrows. Those arrows should read March 20th. Are who's, who's making the decision on hiring the firm? Is it the board who will vote to approve based on a recommendation from you and Andrew, or was it go, will it go through facilities committee? So if we follow the same process as the equity audit, um, it would make sense that the facilities committee would do interviews with myself and Andrew. Great. And then, um, with Andrew and I doing most of the reference checks and that kind of thing. And then we come to the board with a nomination. Yeah, that work, that sounds good. So I was able to get a quick glance at this during the, facility, the last facilities and energy committee meeting last week, um, but I still haven't been able to really give it enough time to do like a really close read of it. Um, so that's my sort of first overarching concern is that this was this was provided to board members on Friday on a long weekend. Um, I'm not sure that we've had enough to, uh, time to really be thoughtful about the wording or, or you know, how we wanna present this, how we wanna move forward. I I feel like um, I would feel better if we could postpone the vote until the next meeting. That would make me feel a little bit better just to sort of sit with it for a little longer. Um, I have two other questions. The first is just sort of something that we had discussed at Facilities and Energy. The, the piece in this proposal um, or request for proposals RFP, the piece in here that, that um, mentions or Roxbury Village School and like a process around Roxbury Village School. I worry um, and I'm happy to be convinced, you know, otherwise, but I do have a little bit of a concern that 
there we might be in a position of sort of over promising and under delivering for that process the way that our constituents might imagine it. Um, so there's people on, you know, there's people that live in Roxbury where this is their community school. If when they see this, I would imagine that there would be a flood of emotions around, well, here, here it is, here's the signal that they're going to consider closing our school. Um, and so like, is that really the question in this RFP? And if not, I think we need to be very clear that that's not really the question. Or if it is one of the questions on the table, then are we able to hold a process with fidelity with the Roxbury community around what their future um, holds if one of the options that this company proposes is to close that school? Um, so it feels, I, I just feel like sort of nervous around what it might mean to people when they read this. And I wanna clarify that as much as possible in the language of the RFP so that people understand like what this process will hold for the future of Roxbury Village School. There's also, we've heard from constituents on the other side where it's like, you know, it costs more money to educate an individual student at Roxbury Village. It's an additional tax burden that should be um, explored. <clears throat> so will those constituents read this and think, okay, great, we're finally having the conversation and are we actually having the conversation? So that's, I just wanna make sure that we're clarifying in the document that piece and, um, or at least at, at these open meetings, clarifying that piece. I have a question. I know I'm supposed to direct things to you, but I have a question for Emma. Is it, is it a separate conversation or could it be a conversation that, is part of the holistic conversation of what is the future of our district. It could be. I just know how um, committees have gone in the past around emotionally heated topics. Mm -hmm. And I just am not sure that this time frame is enough to hold that conversation with fidelity. And I also want to make sure that, you know, um, that the Roxbury community is able to, you know, maybe there's a concurrent process that's happening so that when this architecture firm goes to the Roxbury community for feedback, that they have already been having a process of community input and that they can present that community input to the architectural firm. I'm not sure. I just, I mean, basically my overarching thing is that I haven't had enough time to really understand what it means that the Roxbury Village School is included in this RFP. And I mean, all schools are included in the RFP, but it is sort of pulled out as a topic of discussion in the RFP. So. I just wanna have more time to sort of sit with what that actually means. And then if there's anything that we can do to the wording of the RFP to make sure that we're clarifying what the process, what we're hoping to get out of the process. If we're gonna, if we're gonna call out Roxbury Village School and the future of Roxbury Village School in the RFP, I think it might lend itself to like a couple. I know Andrew wants us to be simple and, and to the point, but I think it could use one or two more bullet points about what we're actually asking uh, to happen around that question, because it is a pretty big question and it's been brought up over the years um, by both sides of it. Um, and then my other question is around funding. So I'm guessing that the money for this will come from fund balance. And I just wanna get clear on sort of the numbers where we're at right now and how much discretionary funding we have in there. I don't know. That's okay. Uh, put it in there. Afford it, right? <laughs> but we had also yeah. discussed potentially yeah. removing that your match funds. That. that was part of our conversation. All right. uh, Scott? Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I guess I have a, a, a quick question and comment. Um, I'm wondering, so the timeline as it's written in this draft RFP right now, if I, I I'm not re reading it, um, but if I remember correctly, and someone mentioned that the report would be back to the board sometime in March. Um, and if that's correct, I, I don't see a cost associated with holding off for at, for at least a, 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 another board meeting because any recommendations that would come in March would not be acted upon um, by the board, right? And so, and so I am I'm, I agree with what Emma was saying. I, I do think getting an opportunity to, to to be a little bit more intentional about the wording 
um, and, and give us give the board a chance to to take a quick look to make sure. Um, I, I also agree in, about the. I, I don't see why. I don't see the benefit to specifically mentioning the future of Roxbury schools in the RFP. Um, I think the RFP is clear. In fact, the section of right above it says, looking at all the facilities, um, which includes the high school and the Roxbury Village School. And so, and so I think we would unnecessarily be stirring um, emotions by, by calling out um, the Roxbury School. Um, I think if if there's a decision to be made that that process would be separate and not led by an architectural firm, probably led by um, you know s someone more uh, adept in um, community engagement. Um, but but yeah, I, I I just don't think that we should be um, conflating uh, those two issues um, in this RFP. Crystal, yeah. This is to basically piggyback both Scott and Emma at this point, but I do think, you know, I think the language does feel charged. It feels like a bit of a cliffhanger. It feels like the um, fate of the school kind of hangs in the balance of this process. And I think that, you know, a historical retrospective on kind of how RVS has also been thought about. I mean, there's been um, you know, kind of alternative complementary potential uses of RVS considered. I under is this is before my tenure on the board, but including like an immersion language school, outdoor education, because the school has also been seen as an asset. It's a solid building. It is a rural, it's a kind of rural campus. So, you know, I think any of this also, right, like there's no foregone conclusions. The reason we're engaging in this process is to like throw it all at the wall, get community input. Um, to be kind of having these sort of deeper exploratory conversations, you know, at, at the board. Um, and so I, I do agree that I feel like that wording needs to be finessed because it does feel like limited because I feel like what we're talking about is like future use and potential educational, you know, opportunities at RBS. So it's not like I guess future of just feels really binary, like open closed. And I feel like that's how it's oftentimes experienced out in our community. And it is very triggering. Um, and assumptions are, you know, assuming things is never a great, you know, response, but it certainly does happen. And I certainly want to be prepared to kind of respond to like, if somebody, when somebody watches this, here's, you know, this conversation, um, you know, to provide a response and be able to frame it for them. You know, I think the other historical piece, you know, and I'm not sure where this fits in necessarily, but in terms of the board's awareness of kind of what the, I call it the, the marriage contract, but the merger document, how it talks about in 2018, uh, sorry, 25, five years into the merger that, you know, there could be a process to consider use of RBS and any closure of the school would be, de would be determined by a vote of the school board. So I understand that the that timing has now arrived. And so that's why it's feeling like the, you know, this, this question um, is appropriate to have at this time. Um, but I, I agree in that finessing the language and getting, I, I think I'm also most concerned with the capacity of this process um, to hold that conversation, uh, have adequate community engagement and input uh, because it's really, really big for our community. That school is like the heart, soul, and hub of our town. It's where the family connections are currently happening, such that when our kids do come to the middle school and the high school, folks can figure out carpooling. You know, just the, the connections are being forged mm -hmm. at RBS. And it's 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 really essential. And there are the very real pieces of, of, of the cost. And there's the real pieces. I know it was it was a close call this year in, in stopping the school, you know, at the end of um you know, this, this fiscal year and moving into this school year. So there are things I just, I do have concerns that this process is going to be able to adequately hold that, like that conversation. And I do wonder if another couple weeks of kind of finessing and ruminating and getting feedback um, would be advantageous to make sure that we're getting it right. So. Yeah. I, um, I 
don't have the same concerns that were just voiced by Emma, Scott, and Kristen, largely because what we would get at the end of this process is a recommendation from the consultant, and then the board would have more work to do. So the board would have, would get a lot of different pros and cons is what I'm imagining for many different scenarios in a, in this report and recommendation. And then we would have to decide which path are we going to go down first with more conversations and more community engagement. So that's why I feel like it's, it's okay to put it, this out there and then interview the firms and get started on the process because there's going to be a lot more work to do even after we get, even after it ends <laughs> Yeah, with that. I mean, I, I understand the concerns hugely. And I mean, I was, you know, part of the merger committee and one of, and I, I'm you know, very sensitive to how much that school means for Roxbury. And I mean, I think part of the reason I feel it needs to be included and, you know, maybe we can do some finesse around language is I think it's really important to get the information so the board can working with both communities make an intelligent choice. So I think what I see this is, is something that's going to give us a lot of information, both, you know, kind of hard information, you know, numbers, you know, the the real estate situation, you know, also, you know, what climate change is going to look like for this building, uh, and also a lot of community input in terms of, you know, how people feel about the buildings, what people's needs are. And then I think any decision based on, you know, the future of Roxbury, I would hope would be informed by that, not decided by that. And then sure. we, you know, we'd bark and bought another process. I mean, what I don't want to do is not get any information about the Roxbury Village School because, you know, as you, you stated, you know, we almost had a staffing crisis this summer. We do not want to be in a situation with Roxbury either due to like a budget crunch or, you know, staffing situation where we make a quick decision that has a longer term impact on that community. I think the sooner we make Knowledge, gaining knowledge and gaining information about how best to use that facility, both for the district and the community, the better. And this seems like a great opportunity to get that information and and inform future actions and future decisions. Really quickly, Jim. Um, is I, I absolutely agree with you and and that's why i really appreciate get getting this rfp out there um i, I guess the question i have is it isn't the isn't it the same reason um the the, the rationale is the same for the high school right yes absolutely. But the, the high schools the high school is, is not mentioned in the rfp right the the section right above where roxbury is called out it says all of the facilities so so I just, I guess I don't, I don't write RFPs and I don't read them, but I question the benefit of calling out one school in the RFP and I can see some real potential costs. And so I, I if you took it out, Roxbury school would still be a part of the, the study as a result of the RFP. And so I, that's the only, I guess that's the only, the point that I'm trying to make is that is that all of the schools inclusive of Roxbury would be included in the RFP, even if that one sentence was struck from the RFP. Yeah, the the high school is specific. I mean, one thing we could do is in, if you're looking at the, the document, it's 1D, we could say district configuration, including the future of all facilities. Potential. Yeah, including the, you know, you know potential future uses of all facilities. Exactly. Yeah. Makes sense. Like yeah. I'm yeah. hoping that Main Street Middle School, I mean, I'm not to, not to throw another log on the fire, but we've definitely <laughs> been very aware that that has, we have like kept it running and it is not providing what our staff and our students need for that really important time as much as it could, because it's, aging and it's bursting and um there are very real like traffic and safety challenges so i like the idea of every building as part of this holistic look because i we couldn't we wouldn't be able to look at one without looking at the overall mm -hmm. and it's sort of 
but happy to list the schools so that people really know that we're like um yeah does that address the feelings um that it's being singled out if we took it out i just feel underprepared to make a vote i mean i don't know how much money we have in the fund balance right now exactly i know that it's probably fine but i would like to know the answer to that question and i just would like more time to um read do a very careful read of this document personally if others are ready to move forward then i can just vote my will um i mean the, the credit potential range is 50 to seventy five thousand dollars. not saying we, we should we have According to the auditor, we have a 200,000 surplus from last year alone. Yeah, after yeah. the 2 million that was earmarked for the track, I think, yeah, at least. This price range. I mean, if it can be done for that much money in this much time, that's it's a tall ask. This is a major ask. It's a huge ask. I mean, nothing drove home the dangers more than being days away from not having a 3-4 teacher at that school before a decision would need to be made be, to potentially send the 3-4 classroom to UES. That would have been a shock. That would have demanded action. And it would have been all kind of behind closed doors. Um, and so that, that, that scared the whatever out of me i really think that the extra fifty thousand dollars in a 28 and a half million dollar budget is i don't know i mean that's a us not a real issue um it is challenging to do classes there um to teach well um i think and i would like to know what are potential future out, you know, what are the possibilities? Uh, and, and I'm, but I'm also, we're, this is the process right now. You know, I, I don't know, I, I, I'm thinking of Jill's comments and like, this is a big ask of some firm to do this. And the longer we delay, the less time they have to do it well. Um, the less time we have to get strong proposals, the less time they have to do the work. I, I don't know why I don't know that we need to wait two weeks to change the language that we can't just do it now. Um, I'm not I don't I feel like we're reasonable. It's not overly rushed. Um, but that's kind of my personality, which has its drawbacks. And I totally fully recognize that. Yeah. I'm just going to make a motion so we can decide either way. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, I move to approve the RFP as amended tonight in the meeting. That and, and as a message, man, it is in one B, it, it will be changed for a district configuration, kind of comma, including the potential future uses of all facilities. Yeah. Uh, um, do you have a second? I think I. Awesome. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? I'm just going to abstain. Do you want to, I was going to ask many abstentions. I'm, um, I'm supportive of the RFP. Yeah, I am. And and I will I will I will vote as a yay as well. Um, so seven yays and an abstention. But no, very fair. Am I? I definitely understand that. Um, May I? Ask? Yes. No, I think your point's well taken. But yes. That I mean, we're all busy people, and the board is a lot of work. We get a lot of paperwork. And it would be good to have enough lead time to really consider things before we have to vote on them. I, I do hear what you're saying. Yeah, yeah no, absolutely. No, it's in, in very fair. Um, I, I think we have a retreat now. <laughs> We're ready for a two hour meeting. Uh, should we take uh, two or three minutes to. Let's take five. Let's say five. Okay. We'll start at seven. All right. Well, then let's dive in. And we're keeping that in mind and we'll try and keep our eye on the screen. Um, we'll start with just a quick recap and a 
kind of overview of how the rest of tonight's going to go. Um, so as most of the folks in this room know, we at our August 9th board meeting was a four hour part, half day retreat where we used all of the had continued the work that came out of the um, visioning work and the definition of what our vision is and how we accomplish the mission of the district to clearly articulate what we mean by our top three priorities of closing the academic gaps, um, safety, belonging, and wellness, and community engagement. And what we mean by those, including what we believe to be indicators of success within those three priorities, and tonight, the rest of tonight is a continuation of that conversation where we will set goals within those priorities, which as we talked about in, on August 9th, the priority definition and the indicators of success are very are broad and the goals are where we start to get very specific. Um, and that's what tonight is all about. So I thought it would be good to start by just saying out loud for the benefit of folks who maybe haven't been keeping up with the um, conversation with at every step of the way, what those three priorities are and the indicators of success within them. And so I was hoping to get three volunteers to read one each, read one. Great, Kristen, can you do the first one, please? Uh, so the priority is to close the academic <clears throat> achievement gaps. And the indicators would be every student has the confidence and skills to achieve excellence and to support continuous growth along their learning journey. <clears throat> Systems are in place to measure, monitor, and support students on their unique path towards meeting or exceeding grade level expectations. Any barriers based on identity and socioeconomic status of students shall not predict academic su success at MRPS. All students have the access they need to opportunities that will help them succeed. And our graduates envision a limitless path to their future and chosen pursuits of continued learning that benefits themselves and their communities. Number two for us. I can do that. Um, Thanks, Jill. Belonging, safety, and wellness. All students, staff, and families, caregivers feel welcomed in our schools and valued for the unique history, identity, and beliefs that they bring to the school community. The environments, systems, and opportunities that foster student and staff wellness are present, successful, and thriving in our schools. Students, staff, and families caregivers can expect to feel safe and have a strong sense of belonging and healthy connections to our school district. When circumstances arise that jeopardize the feeling of belonging, safety, and wellness, the district provides structures and systems to build resiliency. Resources are available to staff, students, families, caregivers that enable them to access their education and school community members feel those resources are accessible for them. You can read number three for us. Ability. <clears throat> our students are more likely to be successful when our whole school community is engaged in their education. MRPS communicates effectively in a manner that honors and recognizes families' backgrounds and connects family engagement to student learning to foster inviting collaborative relationships. Our families are valued collaborators, partners, monitors, advocates, and decision makers in their children's education. Success looks like a broad and diverse group of stakeholders who contribute to the school community and decisions that are transparent and accountable. set the goals within each of those three priorities, we're going to follow a, the same flow as we did the last meeting, which is we'll break up into small groups, one for each of those um, priorities. And each of those groups will have 20 minutes to start to draft the goals within their priority that they're responsible for. Then we'll come back together as a big group to share and offer each other feedback. Then we'll break up into slightly different small groups so that who will take what was initially started and the feedback that came in the bigger session and continue to work through the um, the draft goals, come back together as a big group to do similar report out and share feedback. 
and then break up into small groups one more time to revise and set the goals. Any questions on how that's going to go? All right. And for anybody following along at home, the documents that we're using for this are up on the um, board web page as part of the materials for this meeting in case you want to check them out. Okay. So then let's dive into the small first round of small group work. Um, tackling closing the achievement gap will be myself and Jill. Belonging, safety, and wellness will be Emma and Kristen. And community engagement will be Lynn, Jim, and Rhett. So why don't I come over to you, Jill? And Kristen, you're going to come over to Emma. And Libby, we would love you to float yep. like you did last time. And the third group, you can maybe gather at the table, the central table. And Jake, if you want to join any of the groups to, you know, you both say, you can be opposite right here. Great. I have 20 minutes in these first conversations. Okay, great. Okay. Are there any questions about it? Yeah, and then there's something that needs to be with the Claire, yep. I guess. So, uh, yep, so all this down to tomorrow. Well, you say this. Let's go. I need to do that. Yeah, yeah we've got that up. Great. I'm going to pull up the yeah. email that I sent to all those questions. Yeah. Okay. So do that part. Yeah, and as soon as you do that, then you can put. That's, okay. the, that's the main reason. Got it. But other than that, then we can have these two forms after one to two minutes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Oh, good. Thank you. All right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Oh, sorry. So, yeah, so what we're doing is we're uh, writing out our. Sure. We have sort of our vision, our focus you know our approach our values and then these are the priorities and indicators for the next like three years i think it's sort of the timeline we're trying to go by so these are like, like evergreen measures and then goals for 2023 to 2025 so like being more specific about how we would measure those things yes yeah. is this something that the school board does periodically yes so, okay. it's the first time we are doing it as the board for montpelier roxbury but um right. The ideally the things that are indicators of success would like always be true. And then every every two years or so we would come back to the goals and say, are these still the things we are putting like more specific focus on? Like for example, the first one of our first draft goals is that 90% of all third graders, regardless of identity or socioeconomic status, end the year able to read at or above above grade level. And one of the reasons that we've named that is that it's an important milestone in any child's education journey is that, you know, by that third grade point. And um, because it's one of the things that we've identified is actually could use more focus uh, in our school community is literacy, um, especially in the elementary school level. So the question is, should that be a goal that like by 2025, we've gotten to 90%? Is that actually, is that realistic? In addition to being ambitious, it's certainly ambitious. So it's one of the questions we're gonna ask Libby when she comes back is like, we really like the idea of that milestone and setting some kind of um, goal for that milestone, but is 90% the right number? Is 2025 the right deadline? What percentage you're at um, reading level right now? It's a little hard to tell. I went back and looked at our data. It's a little hard to tell because right now it's presented as school wide for the most part, but 
if I can, it, it yeah. looks yeah. like maybe it's a round six, like two thirds yeah. to three quarters, two, maybe somewhere in there. All right, so last question for me. No, so keep going. In a very specific goal of 90%, and you knew that you were more like 65%, that means that like the school board somehow like allocates more resources or like, first and third grade intervention that's one action we could take yeah and yeah. it's another another way we would use this goal is accountability of our superintendent and her team like all right what are you doing about this and do you need more resources to be able to get to this goal yeah mm -hmm. Right, and we just started like a new data tracking piece, and we have a new position who is actually like um, ready. He's like a family liaison, <laughs> so he actually is has taken on this chronically absent yeah, piece, and so we're gonna and like he literally will like go talk to families. He will reach out to kids. He will like arrange rides for them because if the kids are absent, they're not here to eat or to get anything. So like this is pretty high, especially for students in low socioeconomic you know, that lunch that sort of thing um they tend to be much more yeah, so it's, it's pretty high right now we're at 30 30 percent 34 across the board not just it with it so that means 34 percent we want to bring that down chronically absent what is, what's the threshold for chronic is it 18 or? days or 11 days uh it depends where you are or what part of the school it's 10 percent of the school year thus far so yeah, my kid is chronic dioxin. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. My mine as well. <laughs> when Nick oh. started throwing the data at me, I was like, crap, we must chronically no. absent. <laughs> so there are things we can now start to measure, right? So like if students are closing their gap and they can actually move out of special education services, that would be considered a success, right? So whatever we think that percentage should be. Yeah. So what I think in the, I, I would love to hear from you, Libby, your feedback on some of the ones that are drafted already. I think the chronically absent goes in the the third back to engagement. Oh, down. belonging, safety, and wellness. Yeah. Okay. That goes in yep. a different. Uh, that goes in a different. Okay. Sure. That's where we put that bucket. Yep. Uh, and the okay. piece. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so that would be one thought about the chronic absence. Sure. Oh, I don't have edit access. Um, should we access to that I think it's just like a note. I think you have that access. Are you in this one, Kristen? Are you in this one? Um, yeah. well, you don't. So some things that we know matter for academics, okay. right? Ninth grade matters quite a bit, so mm -hmm. there there oh. should be something in there. Yes, for I can. I'll fix it. Yeah, this is like a holding place for what that would be. I don't know what it would be, but yeah, yeah it, I think it should be something around proficiency. So our goal in, internally is that all students will be proficient in priority standards or in grade level priority standards, proficient or above. That's how we're defining high levels of learning. So ninth grade would be algebra one. Mm -hmm. Right, would might be an indicator. Um, English one, general science. Sure, it's not called general science. So I'm killing my blank it out right now. I don't feel like it is integrative science. Integrative science. Um, are the are the you know, and then I think it's like a global studies kind of course. Mm -hmm. Um, would be the four core content areas, right? Well, oh, language arts is what the one I'm missing here. Uh, yeah, uh, it's just English nine. Uh, English, yeah. Those are the core content or core content courses for, you know, I'd probably focus in mostly on the English and the math specifically. Uh -huh. um, so that's an indicator. Another indicator for high school is the number of students who take AP courses. Right. Mm -hmm. So currently our data indicates that a tremendous amount of, with 42 kids taking AP coursework now. They may not be 42 separate kids, but mm. we, have, we, have 40, we have 42 kids who are taking AP. They may be taking multiple AP classes, mm -hmm. is what I'm trying to say. Christina mm -hmm. Kimball's son takes seven AP classes over the course of this year because he's like wicked smart. Wow. Um, 
So, however, I can look at the, the data on my computer. I don't have it absolutely memorized, but um, 17 of those students qualifies for and reduced out of the 42, mm -hmm. right? So you might want to think of an indicator of increasing high level academic coursework like identifying factors should not indicate something around mm -hmm. and identifying factors should not be an indicator of whether or not they take high level coursework. That's actually a higher proportion than I would have thought. Mm -hmm. yeah. 72, 17. Yeah, out of out 42. Of, out of 42, but it, really it's out of 35 if one kid's taking seven. Well, other kids are taking that. So we'll do it. Um, so I would just encourage us to look across the grades. At, yes, right. Um, like the third grade indicator, of course, is an important one, right? There's ample research to suggest that we want third graders reading at proficient levels, grade level, you know. Um, except we can, and we can't ignore what's happened, what needs to happen here as well. Uh, it's interesting. It's changing. So because of the universal lunch, there's going to be a longer answer to it should be a simple question, but you're a finance guy, right? <laughs> because of the universal lunches, we have, the state has to come up with a different way to qualify that. So now they're using direct certs and it actually increased our percentage of qualifies. Oh, yeah. So now across, we were like 18% across the district, 18 to 20% is a general thing that I usually use. Now we're more towards 30 across wow. the district because of the direct cert. I don't think we're quite at 30%, but we're around 25 to 30. Will that help us in the waiting? It will. Is that yeah. Yeah. Hopefully, yeah. yeah. So, okay. Um, and the 18 percentage, 17 out of 42 is higher than the 30%. Mm -hmm. so, right, that's like the a, proportion of- Pretty remarkable indicator. Mm -hmm. Like that percent of kids taking a classroom during the first lunch is higher than the whole mm -hmm. population. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Another thing you could think about for the high school is, is community based learning and flexible pathways. Who's mm -hmm. taking that? Right. I can share some data with you right now if you want to just have that at your fingertips for that kind of stuff. Yeah. I guess I wonder if we're not, we're doing pretty good on percentage of kids. Do, taking AP, AP, then we don't necessarily need to set that as a goal. But if it's, shouldn't we set goals around things that we want to like improve on? What about passing the assessment? Yeah. So that's the only reason why that data is so fresh in my head because Jason asked me to pay for the assessment for students who qualify. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. <laughs> so we reduce any barrier yeah. to that. And so we're paying, it's a significant chunk of change to pay for those assessments. So we're putting 25,000 out of what else towards paying the AP test mm -hmm. this year. Mm -hmm. um, and then next year, Jason's going to work that into his budget. So those are just some thoughts to think mm -hmm. for you all to consider. Mm -hmm. I'd say the big ones are third grade literacy and math, mm -hmm. our ninth grade literacy and math. Mm -hmm. The other thing to just throw in there is that height we say all kids will have any choice available. So four-year college should be a choice. And in order to do four-year college, to have that choice, then you need you need proficiency in algebra two. So that mm. might be the measure mm -hmm. instead of algebra one, just as that. But maybe not the ninth grade, more just that yeah. high schoolers graduate yeah. proficient in algebra two. Yeah. Uh -huh. And you're, the ninth grade indicator may go better with belonging safety and you know that they feel like they belong to you know high schoolers who are or ninth graders who are attached to the building and natalie right mm -hmm. super attached to the building doing lots of things lots of friends lots of extracurriculars and curriculars like we're not worried about natalie right <laughs> right it's the kid who's right. super disengaged from anything right so it may be a better indicator for mm -hmm. social emotional learning mm -hmm. And what what was your thought about the one that I had seen in that article that I read that was like one school board somewhere who was looking at um, growth? And I was thinking also about Mike's comment yeah. in the June meeting that really an, an indicator of success is like, how are our students progressing? So this was just a, an example. Um, do, do, do. 100 percent of students in our district would begin making one and a half years worth of growth in reading and math each year. 
those numbers look, seem very large to me, like every single student and a hundred and a half, a year and a half's worth of growth. seems like a lot of growth in one year. I mean, yeah, I can, they, this school district was way far behind. When I, yeah, what I struggle with, and Mike and I have good debates over this, as you can imagine, two wonky people uh, <laughs> going after each other on this kind of stuff, not going after each other, just, but we get in good debates. Mike's our director of curriculum and instruction, just to make sure we're being dropping here. Um, I think growth is a good indicator for students who are behind. Uh huh. I think proficiency is a good indicator for the board level. Okay. It's uh -huh. grander. Right. Yeah. Uh huh. And so a kid who's reading behind, right? They need to make more growth, right? Than a kid who's reading on level. Yeah. Right. And we sure we want big growth for the kid who's reading on level. It's more of an urgent factor for the kid who's. Re I don't know how you write that as a goal. Does all kids growing a year and a half? What if it's a second grader who's oh, reading yeah. at an N and moving them to a Q? Yeah is inappropriate text for that second grader. Right, like I wouldn't want them, the, the themes are too much for an eight year old. You know, like it just, it grows in a weird way. Right. So that that's my critique about that, yep. or my worry about that. And I wonder if for the school board, mm -hmm. which is should be way up here. Yeah. If it's more about proficiency. And then we have to say, then we have to get this number of kids growing a year and a half. Right, in order to meet this goal. Mm -hmm. And then how does that address the students who, you know, who are at proficiency, but we, but could use an extra challenge? Yeah, we, it's the RTI stuff, it's the enrichment stuff, right? That when, remember the four questions, what do we want students to be able to know, be able to know and be able to do? So what are our priority standards? Uh -huh. How do we know if they know them? Right for uh -huh. informative assessments. What do we do when they don't? When they're not proficient? Uh -huh. How do we react? What do we do when they already know them? Yeah, the pre-assessment. We're not great at that last question, <laughs> but it's a question we we're asking in our collaborative teams. And should we set a goal at the board slash broad district level about that, or should our goals focus more on proficiency? I think our goals should focus on grade level or above proficiency. Okay. Okay. That's simple. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's the wording we use with the teachers. We're defining high levels of learning of all students being proficient in grade level or above. Grade level or above proficiency in our priority standards. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think it's the board's discretion, and I would encourage you to focus in on the core contents of literacy and math mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for academic achievement. So then what we're saying here, this is one, we still have a lot of goals under yeah, yeah. achievement, um, but this is one that I really liked a lot. We thought of this when Jill, Scott, and I had our small group back in the end of June. This was one that you brought in from the Career Center that I thought was really Cool, which um, Jake, the way it reads is that 90% of students, regardless of identity or socioeconomic status, report that their teachers and administrators have high expectations of them. And that we would we would do that through more formal student surveys, I think is how we would learn that. But wondering what you think of that as a goal. I think it belongs in those um, belonging safety and wellness. Oh. Seems great. Like Mm -hmm. That's exactly what I was thinking. I think you can take out F for, uh, that close their gap uh -huh. and move out of special education. I mean, the death of, yes, that happens occasionally, but right. like, when we're identifying a student with a disability, that's not something that we can, that goes away. Right, okay. right. Okay. And I think, you tell me if I'm not, if I'm wrong about this, but special ed students are included in yeah, our identifying nine, factor 90 yeah. percent of all third graders yeah. so we would you know they yeah yeah so the rule of thumb <laughs> generally with students with disability or when people are like get the yeah buts for for this the question i ask people is when that student graduates will they be expected to ind live independently and pay rent on their own Right. Yeah. yeah. That is 98% of our students. Yeah. We have a very small, that's 2% of our students will not, you yeah. know, they will never be, be able to do that on their own uh -huh. or be expected to do that on their own. 
um, and they will have plans and support for the rest of their life, right? Mm -hmm. um, but if they're expected to pay rent at some point in their world, <laughs> then they are included. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's yeah. not to say the kids who don't pay rent aren't included. It's to say they have incredibly specialized plans and they will yeah. for the rest of their lives. Yeah. Yeah. And should we, so what numbers would you put in here if we're going to have a goal of percentage of students taking AP classes, regardless of, do you, would, should we say, would, do we want it to be higher than 42 or is 42 so we roughly have three, for our, we have around 400 students. So that's 10, around 10%, but except some of them take more, but so it's a little less than 10%. Probably. And that's not included of co early college classes. Either. Like mm -hmm. that number could be, I would include early yeah. oh, college sure. classes, which I don't have that number yeah. right now. Mm -hmm. off the top of head. You could so. say taking AP and or early college. I mean, I don't know if uh -huh. part of the job. I think if we're up to, I mean, if we're 10% now, if we were to say 25%, still a significant job. Uh, yep. <laughs> yes. Yeah. We may be higher because there are kids who are taking, right. so maybe 30%. You know, like, I'd have to get that number from that to see. I don't think a whole lot of kids do early college, but certainly do some. Uh-huh. Yes. And how about flexible pathways and career? What would be a challenging but also realistic goal? I think for that, it's not the number of students. It's the number. It's the one that concerns me is which students are doing that. Got it. Mm -hmm. so, we have around 40 students doing flexible pathways as well, but so around 10%. So flexible pathways means that's not the same as the career center, right? No, it's not. It's something like so that was our that was our timer. Time to wrap up <laughs> these initial thoughts. More work to be done, don't worry. Or more time for the work to be done, I should say. So I do have early college numbers. 13 kids are early college. Wow. Oh, right on. Um, none of them are eligible for free. Interesting. Hmm. Hmm. It sounds like what we would be setting for the goal here, and then we'll wrap up and present to the group. Those are just ideas, too. You may not want those, but the flexible path. Yeah. Yeah. It's well, let's, idea. let's start there. And I think the way then we would word this one is, the there's like little to no difference between the percentages of our demographics and the percentages of kids taking using taking advantage of flexible pathways in the career center so like you were saying you know 30 percent of our kids right now qualify for free and reduced lunch well then 30 percent of the kids in flexible pathways in the career center should be kids who mm. qualify. Mm. So we have 30 kids going to the career center right now, and six of them qualify for free or reduced lunch, which yeah. is 20%, one fifth. It's nice. That was impressive. We're actually not people. I want to get Um. All right. Well, we're going to. That's interesting, too. No, we're just going to put this my here. Head out of her. Yesterday at dinner, because my daughter went to the college school. Oh, she's like, does that mean that she won her education is over? Oh, oh my God. Oh. <laughs> no, Mom. <laughs> Not in the slightest. It doesn't. Why would you encourage her to do that? <laughs> oh, my God. Well, it's not 1960 anymore. <laughs> she's not going to welding school. <laughs> she's, she's watched Grease 120. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Okay, then I'm just going to write this so get it out there. Okay. Ready? <laughs> Too bad. Just yeah. kidding. There's a water fountain. You did? Good. All right, gang. We are, we've got the first set of priorities. So why don't we go ahead and go first?
we did some refining of some goals that had worked their way into the conversation in previous retreat spaces and also moved a few that had we had thought maybe meant were appropriate for academics um, into belonging, safety, and wellness um, to try them out there. So what we've got so far are that 90% of all third graders, regardless of identity or socioeconomic status, end the year able to read at or above grade level. Um, our ninth graders, we need a percentage there, are proficient in Algebra 1, Integrative Science and Global Studies, and English 9, though we're trying, um, considering the idea of putting a little bit of a higher priority on the core concepts of math and um, and English or, you know, literacy at the high school level, which is why those are in bold right now. That 30% of our high school students are taking AP classes and or early college edge classes, co college classes, regardless of identity and socioeconomic status. That there's no difference in our demographics of students taking pl flexible pathways and um, career center options. Um, the options for students to pursue experience will prepare them for whatever choice they make after graduation. I think we didn't really discuss that one, in my opinion. I don't think we need that one anymore if we've got these others that address AP classes and flexible pathways. Um, and we, yeah, we didn't really talk about F and G yet. So they're still there for the next small group to discuss. Initial thoughts, feedback for the next group to tackle on these. Are there, how far are we away from a math goal for third graders? Um, it's hard to answer that question. The Cognia results are still embargoed for, and it's a new assessment, right? So one of the things we'd want to talk about as a group is what assessments are we looking at? Multiple assessments. Our REN star data shows that we're closer. Mm -hmm. On that. Yeah. yeah. Our, um, and we're working on getting a better diagnostic than our screener, which is red star. Um, which is called the PNOA. And we just simply don't have that at the moment, but we're working on getting that diagnostic, which would give us a really good indicator of where our math students are. So we, we, we want to get that in, in here when we feel measure, I guess. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we put that in or leave it out, just flag it in our minds. Obviously it's not going to be left out. Whatever it is. It also depends on what the, how long the board is looking to work on these goals. Right? Those we are, any deadlines yeah, 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 yeah. Like that's pretty high bar, but depends on how long you're looking at it, right? About three minutes for each yeah, set I mean, of goals to offer feedback. That's, that's, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. I mean, that's my big question. You know, setting setting targets like that, just knowing, knowing it's not a random number, like what are we assessing it against? You know, do the assessments make sense? Is 90% a realistic number? Um, yeah, because if it's like a rigorous test, if 80% of the rigorous test actually says that you're doing better than 95% of the kind of less rigorous or, oh. yeah. Yeah. Was, uh, I think, I think knowing what's behind our data. But at some point yeah. we need to measure. Yeah, exactly. Is that something else they have to do? And is that in your continuous improvement plan? Isn't that? Aren't we those... can angulate the data. I think it would just be up to our team to show you what where we are with multiple measures, and and educating the board on what each of those measures actually measure. Right. <laughs> Black, we're using a word too many times in one sentence. What were you going to say? 
Oh, I just, I like the goals that are very specific with the, um, like the X percent of ninth graders are proficient in algebra one. I'm guessing that's going to be reported out based on like actual classroom grades. Um, so I like that those sorts of goals that are. The ninth graders are also the last year they take the cognitive exam. Okay. Except for science. Mm -hmm. But yeah, um, Kristen printed up Smarty again. So just like bringing it back to that, you know, um, and that one, that one seems to be a Smarty goal. S is um, strategic. M is measurable. A is ambitious or aggressive, aspirational. R is realistic. T is time bound so that it has a deadline. I is inclusive and E is equitable. So it's a way, it's like a way of being like, oh, does it kind of meet all of these things? Great. Then it's a solid goal to set. Mm -hmm. Yeah. On the realistic um, component, like, you know, for achievement gap, there's how is Montpelier compared to other school districts? You know, obviously you would want to be close or better than other school districts. And then also an achievement gap, it could refer to within our district, our different groups of students, you know, performing in similar ways. Yeah. Um, so like you, you probably have studied the data. So when you say like 90% of all third graders, that sounds, you know, in terms of it being realistic, like and you told me 60, we're at 65%. And that's hard to tell, right? From what, the way that the data is organized right now. So, like in my mind, I think, well, how are other districts third graders doing? Are mm -hmm. they at ninety percent? Because if they're at ninety percent and we're at sixty-five percent, that's sort of an issue. But are they at fifty percent? Well, we're at sixty-five percent. Then that makes that ninety percent seem stratospheric. Yeah. We generally score higher than Savard. Then the state averages on statewide testing. That's really the only measure we can, we know how others are doing is statewide testing. Because well, the, the other smaller assessments that are district decisions, they're district decisions. So people use different assessment measures and you can't compare apples to oranges. But the statewide assessment, you can certainly do that. I do wonder about adding something in here. Um, about like a certain percentage of our students who qualify for free and reduced lunch, et cetera, et cetera, since that seems to be the real identifying, easily identifiable factor for scoring lower. Um, and that if there would be uh, some sort of, you know, obviously it's already happening, but like something put into place to be like, we wanna see growth with this population of kids. What was that? English as a second language. I learned a couple of minutes ago that the share of students taking AP classes who run free and reduced lunch is actually higher than the overall share of students on free and reduced lunch, which to me is pretty remarkable. And you know, is a is a major achievement. This is good feedback for the next group who will be tackling the goals. I've made it a comment on the in the document, so you can see it there. Those these different um, pieces of feedback. Who had belonging, safety, and wellness? Was that the two of you? All right, where are you at? So we made our notes up above. If you scroll up to our section, sorry about that. And we kind of tried to tackle like each bullet point. And we did take the notes, Mia, that you had sent and sort of started with that. So we only got, I think, really two bullet points in, but we did flesh out that first goal. So we were, and, and in the conversation, we started to wonder like, well, how many surveys do we really want to ask the administrators to do, or, you know, the schools to do in one year? Or like, is this for this school year or next school year? So I think that should be discussed, but um, we have 
that for the 2023-2024 school year that we establish a baseline that data is collected both quantitative and qualitative from our three main stakeholder groups, students, staff, and families slash caregivers with 75% participation across all demographics of our community and a particular effort to collect feedback from historically marginalized groups. 90% of families report feeling, and I guess that, sorry, I would, I would want to um, edit that, but because the indicator is for student staff and families caregivers. So 90% of stakeholders report feeling welcome and a part of our school. What's an, what's an average response rate on a survey? And, it's a, and a good response rate is 30%. Right. We do not get 75% response rate yeah. um, from surveys. Yeah, and we discussed that too in terms of just like qualitative versus quantitative, knowing that, you know, quantitative, when it comes to surveys, you probably hear from that same 30% over and over and over again. And where this, you know, priority is really talking about wanting to hear the perspectives of folks that maybe don't participate in the process in surveys nearly as much. So that's where kind of the qualitative gathering could be more effective in, in, um, in gathering that information, like the work that Nick Connor does, like the work that, you know, some of our like guidance counselors may do, they may be able to provide some more of that um, perspective. Um, so yeah, we kind of wrangled with the qualitative quantitative. Piece. But it does still, even though qualitative or quantitative, we're still asking for in this wording, 75% participation across all the demographics. So another way we could do it is sort of narrow in and ask for 75% of participation for marginalized groups. But then we started talking about like, are we going to be defining these marginalized groups? Like which groups are we collecting from? It also says across all demographics. Um, and so that made, made me start to do like a spin out of like, okay, so is it every language that is spoken, you know, like, or every religion that is practiced? that we're wanting reporting out of every different potential demographic. So it. Right. Right. We about that. And we, yep. yeah. we also can't ask people's religious preferences. So, right. so it just, that one off. it gets very sticky and it's sort of, so I'm open to reducing that number or finding a different, you know, maybe we're most interested in knowing historically marginalized groups. Um, and so maybe we focus in on that for the first year. The other tricky thing is is demo is the end size. So we can share demographic data generally across all four schools. Yeah, I think that would be okay across district. Right. Yeah, we just have to be careful how we share that out. Yeah. Um, one thing I wondered about was if you wanted to involve and add community members to this too, because you, you know a lot more people who don't have kids in the school pay taxes. So I think we want to have people feel welcome here. And I think it's uh, we could. I just the way that this particular um, bullet point is worded. You know, it's welcomed in our schools, valued for for their unique history in within the schools. So, like, I'm not sure how much community members in general like sort of interface with the schools. They come to board meetings sometimes, but talking about what do they or plays or sports events or you know that kind of thing. You'll get grandparents and folks who like sports right and don't have kids in school anymore or that sort of thing I mean I think you want everybody to feel welcome coming in and safe to be here yeah. it goes back to the question about like how big of an ask you know with the with data collection and once we go across all of the indicators um I wonder if it just becomes too broad but Yeah. 
that was time's up. I'll think about that. So we really mostly talked about that first one. And that, and that sort of is like the can of worms. Like we did start fleshing out the second one there. And then with the third one, we just copied and pasted from your email and didn't start. How about community engagement and accountability? So Jim suggested that we come up with a communication committee. He didn't define which committee it would replace, but he suggested that. It's a goal. It's a suggestion. Um, then we were thinking about um, using the bridge a little bit more. We started to use FPF at the end of last year with the summary document that Libby, you created with Anna. Um, so the district effectively announces meetings ahead of time in publicly accessible media like FBF and the bridge, which I think we kind of do, but you know, Mia usually does it, but I don't know, you know. But the may I don't know if the bridge you know, the announcements, they just don't publish enough. Frequently right. enough. Yeah, for yeah. board meeting warnings, but they get the announcements. We were talking about effectively summarizing meetings, which is what we start, what you started to do last year, which I think is really helpful because it kind of counteracts some of the noise. Misinformation. Um, and then maybe sharing things, you know, taking out articles and, you know, right, like Jim, a couple times over the summer, he, he gave links to series of communications that went out about communication about the status of the high school, um, kind of maybe summarizing <laughs> summarizing the budget in a narrative article in the bridge or putting that right in front of a forum, summarizing things like the, res the results of studies from this facilities effort, um, maybe summarizing anything, you know, I mean, the flexible pathways presentation was pretty wonderful. Maybe there's a way to put some of these things in the bridge in a narrative form. Um, just some of the things that we're getting, that we're learning, um, kind of putting it out there, especially the bridge, because uh, as Lynn is saying, you know, it comes out twice a month and it can kind of sit around and people will flip through it and, and take their time with it. It's not like the Argus that if you miss it today, it's, you know, you're on to the next one tomorrow. Front porch form where there are a thousand. Yeah, the front porch form is a little yeah. bit goes a little bit fast. It could even say "look out for the bridge" article. Just ways to put some of the presentations that we're getting into a format that people can consume. Do folks in Roxbury? Well, we have read the, the bridge. If it does it come there? No. Okay. We have the newsy. In the Roxbury which is the former newsletter uh -huh. uh, in Roxbury. And that's widely distributed. And that's like mailed to everybody's home. It's not like you just pick it up at the gas station if you're cruising through, but it's mailed to everybody's home. Yep. And the other thought about Roxbury is there's four posts in one FPF each day. And there are three Montpelier posts in FPF each day sometimes and all three have plus seven postings at the bottom of the list which is just awesome yeah okay so these are the this is the draft here any thoughts or feedback for on these I'm saying that and I have no offering to what <laughs> I mean, the one thing that I keep coming back to is some kind of uh, uh, paid advertisement in the bridge that has a link that people click that gives us data on who clicks on how many clicks it gets. Uh, we do which we data on get. our social media accounts. Yeah, you, so you we can't could, do we could, like that. And, and the bridge would probably be able to report back on clicks too, right? I mean, I'm not that, sure because I'm not sure about that. I'd have to ask them. Plus, some people read the bridge in paper form. Right, which is not going to, no, but it's going to, you know, I think there's a portion of the population that's not going to 
get a lot from front porch forum and they're not going to click on a lot of links yep. uh, that the paper form is still important to get out there. And last year, the principals did sent surveys that were that spoke a bit to communication and engagement. It was part of it was in their newsletters. But that doesn't that would that only goes to families with kids in the school. It doesn't speak to community members who don't have kids in the school. I think we could figure out how to measure it. I think what we're, it, it is, I, I agree. I think these look like the ways that we, that we accomplish it. Like the things that we do to accomplish community engagement, but they're not the goals that we're striving for. And so I think we have to figure out like, what is it to us that would mean true community engagement? What are we looking for? I really enjoyed the, like, our, the effort that was made around um, during COVID, around ESSER funding, uh, community listening sessions. And it was done around the budget too. But like, so Amanda really is sort of like, I feel like she helped push the board to, to host the more community engagement sessions, listening sessions, affinity spaces. So I think we could put that as a goal, like that the board will host X number of listening sessions and affinity spaces throughout the year. Aren't there still like the how we're it done though? And instead of like what we're accomplishing? Improving community engagement and quality of information. Yeah. And I think what we're wrestling with is like, how do you actually measure that? Hey, all. I just want to say really quickly, thank you for keeping me company. I got to go. All right. <laughs> Good luck, right. Scott. Take care. Okay. Well, that's good for the next group to think about. So the next groups tackling these are Jill, Jim, and Kristen are on closing the academic gap, Emma and Rhett on belonging, safety, and wellness, and Mia and Lynn on communication and community engagement. And Jake, you can hang right here or you can join any of the other groups if you want to. And we're going to do this for 15. You're with Jill and Kristen. Yep. Um, Kristen texts me like, in the real question, where's the? <laughs> um, okay, so do we want to start? Do we want to revisit the first one that I read with an eye on yeah. is seventy five percent too much, or do we really just focus on marginalized communities, or how you know like that, or do we move on to the next one? Um, well, I don't know that we can, I don't know, it's, I don't know, I mean, how do we include all demographics? How do we even measure that? And how do we, how do we address the diversity that we want to kind of support and, and gather in a goal where we can easily over over promise because I don't know what all demographics is. Can we just remove know. the word all? You know what I mean? Participation yeah. across demographics of our community. Yeah, that's makes and sense. then like yeah. I mean, because we talked that's Kristen great. and I we talked about defining which demographics the board would be interested in learning about. But like I don't really feel comfortable doing that either. I sort of feel like we don't need to get that granular and we yeah. can just sort of trust the 
administration to like take this and figure it out. We're going to break it up as much as we can. And yeah, trust her to figure it out. <laughs> um, what about, and then what about just dropping that 75 to 50 as an aspirational goal? If we're that's what the district tried to survey before. Yes, and the board has too. Uh -huh. And that's what the survey is. And the how much we get back. Uh, at the state, we did we do crazy efforts to get participation from each department on their on the uh, employee on the satisfaction and right. survey. Like um weird. Like, you know, your commissioner will pull this crazy stuff and get to X percent. Shave the beard. Oh, <laughs> not you know, yes. pie in the face. Right. Right. Okay. Like I don't know. And like have you, key. and yeah. have you, yeah, our, our department had success? is above 90%. And it's because of like the gimmicks and the constant pressure. Yeah. I mean, I'm I, not worried about the staff because we right. just give it during a faculty meeting and say, this is what you're going to do. Right you now. give them time <laughs> to do it. Yeah. And like students could have the same thing. But yeah. then when we talk about families and caregivers, that's where, then. That's where we're stuck. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So if we say 50% participation, can that be inclusive of the staff and the students? So then, therefore, we're sort of covered. We'll probably will get to that number. So that with staff, because I'm assuming you're you're talking about a certain age student, right? Because right, like we're probably not going to be giving this to kindergartners, right? Right. So, uh, so if I add up all of those people, you are you're looking at um, eight hundred. <laughs> no, 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 no. You're looking oh. at probably eight hundred students. Oh, right. Yeah. For um, to get to the 50%. Is it six? How many so students do we have? 15. Oh, yeah. So you're looking at about 800 students. I don't know how many families because of family makeups, right? Right. Yeah. Assumptions. Yeah. Um, and and how many staff? About 250, 300 staff, right? So 50% is easily 800 ish, 500 ish, awesome. if you add in families. That we have never received a response <laughs> of 900 people. 800 students and how many staff? Wait, there's 1,200 students. We have 1,250, yeah. 1,250. 1,250 and then how many staff? 250. 250. So, right, 1,500. So really, if we can get... If we can get 50% of that number, 700. I mean, you. so you're thinking we can get a much higher response rate from the students and the staff than we can from the families. And I'm just saying, if we got higher, if we got like 80% from students and staff and then only got, you know, 30% from families and caregivers, then we would probably be at that 50% number. Do you know what I'm saying? If we like word it right. It won't have to be 50% of families yeah. and caregivers. I'm just pulling up a couple of surveys that we've done before that got high response rates from parents, but that I just know got high response rates. Yeah, yeah. Um, also fine. So here's NHS June COVID. So I'm writing a survey about how the year closure. This is one for that, just as an indicator. The questions around like what were the positive characteristics of schooling during the COVID biggest challenges and so um, in the event we are told to return to part-time or full-time remote next year what would you like the district to consider you know like yeah time questions uh -huh. right and we got 108 responses mm -hmm. from families from representing 100 students representing 1250 students no that's just mhs oh only and MHS. that was an incredibly high response so that's like 25 percent. i'm just trying to look at like what other the surveys that i know we got good response rates from do you, you, you think 30 is a aspirational number cool you know when you design these surveys like um you know you know it's actually you don't have to survey everybody but 
the important part is getting a representative sample. Right. Um, and so, like, even if you got to like 60%, that doesn't mean it's a good survey um, because the 60% may just be the same parents who are engaged all along and the 40% are right. just, who aren't engaged, you know? So it's like, it's more about like survey design. And the way that it's worded, it's like, all students, staff, families, caregivers feel welcomed in our schools and valued for their unique history, identity, and beliefs that they bring to the school community. So I do feel like it's speaking to the, this particular indicator is speaking to historically marginalized groups. And so that's where I was getting at is like, maybe we only put the participation qualifier on histori historically marginalized groups. Uh -huh. Uh, like, can you identify historically five five groups? Like, right. Then, yeah. <laughs> and they have to self identify. And I don't, if you're marginalized because of your drug habit, I don't see your problem. Well, that's where we're talking about all demographics. Like, do we list every single one? But I mean, homelessness, like, drug addicted, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's just like I mean, gets into a rabbit hole. But that's like there are certain groups that you're not going to get much of a response from. So, what? How do you all suggest moving forward with this goal? Because I understand all the. I agree with everything that's being said, and now I just want to sort of like figure out a way to word it to make sense of it. I mean, the goal is to get a representative sample from the different demographic groups. You know, that's obvious, but like the how of that is super hard. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how that that's mm -hmm. hear back from you know from everybody. That's well, maybe that's a fair way to say it. And if it's but we don't know, I so someone else is gonna have to tell me what what is a representative sample? What percentage is a representative sample? Yeah, I mean, like, so, um, it's like, that. that is like how accurate you wanna be, you know? Um, and then you like kind of set what, what amount of people you want to hear back from? Like, if you if you said that I only want to hear back from one person, then you're, that's going to be problematic. That's not going to be accurate. So it's like you have to build out like what's the number that I'm I need to get the accuracy that I'm looking for, um, which is like a, a statistical question. Right. But um, but I don't know. It can be done if you have if the community if the community of parents is 2,500 overall, you know, then you can do the math to figure it out. Like, I don't know if you, if this is heading in that kind of a formal direction, but like, can be done. You know, the, you have families, it's both, right? Right. You just found a survey that parents literally had to choose between virtual learning and virtual learning from the moment, which was by far our highest survey response, and we got 1,100. Out of twelve fifty. Yeah, because they literally had to tell us where they were going to go. Right? It was a, a, how, what, how many hundreds? Half a million. We have not gotten anywhere close to that with any other survey, but that was that was literally, Jane, where do you want your kids to be next year? Yeah, virtual yeah. Learning. I I hear you. I hear you. What about the, um, like, if the school is, is issuing the survey and it's not coming from the board, you can reflect on demographic information that you know to be true, that's private, that this would be an anonymous survey? Right, but I mean, so if someone self-reports on this survey that they're like BIPOC, yeah. And you see, you know that you have 200 BIPOC students in the district or something, right? Then, and 200 people report as being by. I'm just wondering, like that. I'm trying to answer that quick piece of it. I can't. I I wonder if folks are too much on. Who's the one who would be so 
yes, I feel like I am. And I'm, and I want the answer of how to move forward that makes you feel comfortable and like that this is going to work. You know what I mean? Um, so I'm happy to take for you to take the lead on this if you feel like you have wording that's going to work. Well, maybe you just say with a particular effort to collect feedback from historically marginalized groups, 90% of stakeholders report hearing welcome in a part of our school. 90% of respondents. Uh, survey respondents of respondents. That's good. And just delete the whole part about, I mean, I also feel like this is year one of this goal. It's like, let's just see what we get. And then next year, a goal could be like, we want bigger survey participation. You know what I mean? Yeah. How about just with participation across demographics of our community? Yeah, I mean, I think with numbers, then we can start adding or uh, being more specific about it. Like, I think we won't have met this goal if we don't have some respondents self-reporting as BIPOC and feeling welcome and part of the school. Do you know what I'm saying? So we have... We have... Uh, 43 uh, people who Two who identify as Pacific Islander, and five who identify as American Indian. So, kind of like 150 ish. Yeah. And can people identify as multiple, or is that not anyone? And this is from the way the state requires us to report it, which is problematic and has been pointing out to us multiple times. Like, CDG, for instance, Mike, he said that he said he's in a board meeting. Yeah. I don't know what to check. Yeah. Which box to check? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, there's like the assumption that you're going to get underrepresentation from those groups, but do you know that that's true? Like, like maybe you send out a survey and you find that they can really participate at just a higher rate. Yeah, it's just this this sort of like anecdotal, you know, like institutional memory of sending out surveys and not getting a high response rate. And so, like, engaging the community has been yeah. something, and that's why it's one of the main goals. Is like, how do we get community engagement? You know, so it has been an issue. Is that what you said? Hispanic? So you would kind of want So like either Hispanic, people who identify as just pure and Hispanic or strong. white Hispanic, those are the two choices. It's uh, 18 identify as Hispanic and 28 kids who identify as a white Hispanic. Well, I mean, I don't know how to word it. I don't really know that that's true. Like, I don't think we need like different ethnic groups. I think it could just be BIPOC as one of the demographics, you know, it, but it's like Libby is saying, like, it's going to be hard. Like, how do you word that on a survey for not just like, how do you word like people who come from a lower socioeconomic group, right? So like, if you make less than X, Y, Z, like how do you ask a student that? That's not going to be a demographic that we can report out on or religion. So it's just going to be a tough one. At the beginning of standardized tests, they asked that. It, it's optional, but it's like, do you yes. know, and same with census, it's like, do you identify as white, you know, black? Yes. So maybe it's yeah, valid. Yeah, we can ask those questions to students, but then, you know, you know like asking students to self identify in terms of gender identity can be tricky at times. You know, like you have to keep everything anonymous and it's all self identified when you're getting in there, right? But uh, gender identity, for instance, is always going to be self-identity, right? We, we would never track that. We already have some surveys that have a whole section of self-identification self stuff yeah. that has come out of the equity committee. Yeah. So I feel like we can like take those surveys and copy and start. That would be a good starting point. Yeah, we have we have ways to do it. But is the 
the families that report free reduced lunch still reduced because of free lunch? Um, we, we now have a different measure. Different it's case. direct certification. Um, and so that Allen comes from a multiple areas. It actually increases our free and reduced lunch population. So. I'm not surprised. I mean, do you guys want to see if we have any time to discuss the second bullet point? <laughs> so the environments, systems, and opportunities that foster student and staff wellness are present, successful, and thriving in our schools. So we talked about like how it's also challenging to define what does successful and thriving mean, and you would want that to be reported from a variety of stakeholders and not just, you know, a, a, member of the school community like they're a member of their administration it's like yes we have these you know assemblies and they're super successful we want like, students to also be like yes i love all right we're coming back to thank you for looking at you so quickly thank you for thank you for being right on thank you thank you we're good go all right thanks Libby. Keep the same order. Start with um, closing the academic gap. Want me to take it? Sure. Yeah. You yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> Swallow. <laughs> um, a lot of work. You know, this this one is starting to really sort of come together. We talked about some possible um, gaps for some of the other age groups. We have a. It's pretty high school heavy right now. We've got the third grade piece and and. Um, but that we we thought we wanted to sort of look more into, are there other grade level pieces we'd wanna talk about? Um, we also um, massage the language about students at the high school level who take AP classes in early college or who take flexible pathways and career center options. Because what we're trying to get at is that we want that portion, that makeup of students who take advantage of those to not be based on socioeconomic status or demographics. So I think we came up with a pretty elegant terminology that the percentage of students taking advantage of those is proportionate to the student body demographic makeup basically um we also um tried to get at oh did i just do something I nope. do um Sorry. <laughs> tried to get at the piece that a few of the groups have talked about regarding um students on individual education plans that on an individual level we that it does seem like it's a priority of the administration and a better measure is sort of on an individual level the students who show that percent of improvement or progress so that we're not just saying, yes, they, they're they proficient or no, they're not. But if students are making progress towards proficiency, that that would be something we'd want to try to measure. And Kristen put a good note in there that we might want to find out from the pros and administration how best to phrase that. Um, I think that might have been as far as we got. And then the, the last one, we just added a note into like discuss the challenges of getting the hold of, you know, seniors in their final week of school when they are completely two feet out the door. Um, so in terms of getting a sense of what graduates plans are after high school, is there a way that we can lean on the guidance office for any, is that information collected like via guidance that we could lean on that versus getting surveys to kids who are feeling long gone. Uh, yeah, at that point. Great. Great. Thoughts on this new iteration of these goals? Um, Libby, question for you. Would it make sense to have metrics for other elementary school levels or middle school students? Or really is third grade and ninth grade the major milestones? If, yeah. Uh, I think that third grade and ninth grade are major milestones. Yeah. So, and we are an interdependent system. So I think that's that's fine. I would hesitate on the percentage of students on IEP show percentage of improvement because I am not going to look at a parent of a student on IEP and say you're not included in that percentage, right? I I think it's an interesting piece to say show percentage improvement or progress on a on their IEP goals, but I expect all students on IEPs to make progress on their goals, not just a certain percentage of them. 
Oh, okay. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So the, the X there can be replaced with 100. We're just taking out, right? Right. Students on IEP show. I think it's a hard measure, as Peggy Sue has said, because we'd have to figure out a system to do that. Because right now, in order to do that, we'd have to go through every IEP and every goal that's stated for every child to show it. So that's not realistic. We just have to, we would have to figure out how to do that or to give you the information that indicates that we're showing success in that without having to go through every goal on every IEP for every student. Do goals on IEPs have a time frame? Like within yes. 30 days? Not within 30 days, but yes, they have time frames. I think part of the idea of like sticking that out was to kind of highlight, I still kind of hear Mike Berry from that meeting and talking about like progress. It's, you know, yes, it's proficiency, but it's the progress piece that's also really important. And I think I heard leftovers from like the last conversation was that, you know, we're not, we're never going to have a hundred percent, like say at grade level, because one of the markers for like getting on an IEP is that you're not at grade level, right? So we certainly wanted to be like, you know, oh, it's, you know, our students on IEPs are, you know, receiving special education services or like dragging the number down, but we want to be able to highlight kind of that, you know, the progress that's happening there um, and the positives that are happening there or the like, whatever it needs to reveal so that we can better support it or fund it or what have you. So that was like the spirit of including that, but whether it's yeah, possible or sensible. Our expert on that, so on how to question yeah. it is a good idea. Great. Any other thoughts on the? I still think the ninth grade indicators for I, ninth grade is important. I wonder if ninth graders, and we talked about this before. I wonder if it goes in belonging, safety, and wellness because it's the ninth graders who are really connected to the building through co-curriculars and through academics are the things that matter most in that age level. And we know that Algebra 2, as I said in another group, Algebra 2 is an indicator for college, for four-year college ad, um, admission. And so knowing those benchmarks for academics, it might be Algebra 2 that kids are proficient in. Um, and the ninth grade piece belongs in, in the SEL world. So we moved one to the SEL that was, or the belonging safety and wellness that ninth graders indicate feeling and, and being yeah. attached to their school community. But you're talking about the one that's still up here. For academics. Um, yeah. Academics. Oh, interesting. Yeah, and, okay. I, and I might make that algebra too, which includes ninth and tenth graders. Okay. Potentially. And you're not going to be proficient in algebra two without well being well on your way for proficiency in algebra one. Right. They're inter they're interdependent. And then English 10. You could you could just to make it simple, you could play English 10. For 10 again, now we're talking about 10th graders. Yeah. Because the indicator for ninth grade is that they belong. They feel like they are connected to their school community uh -huh. or groups within their school community. That's the important factor. Uh -huh. And 10th graders proficient in algebra two and English 10. Yeah. And after that, why are you laughing at me, Joe Murphy? You look like no. you're laughing at me. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, after that, after 10th grade, kids really spread out and do so many different things. Right. So it makes hard, it makes it hard to measure, give you one measure because 11th graders have multiple choices as to what they take for their English class, for instance. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Whereas 10th grade is the last year yeah. that we are pretty much right. mandating which right. courses exactly. they're taking yeah. Yeah, for English and math. All right. Any other final thoughts on closing the academic gap? My brain might be missing it because the time of day, but um, I'm wondering, like, does this capture kind of like a benchmark that indicates how well we're doing or, it, and it seems to do that, but does it capture closure of achievement gap? Well, if you're saying 90% of all third graders, 
Right. And we do have the language in there regardless yeah. of identity or sister. Okay. You can't get to yeah. 90 without closing that achievement gap. Yeah, no, right. I, I think it's I think I think the language on making sure this is kind of proportional across I, I see it on that one. I guess I was more just talking about the one that we were just discussing. Um I mean the the ninety percent on on achievement gap, it could be I mean that could be our gap. I mean it could be, you know the five to ten percent of students that are, are struggling are that five to ten percent that yeah. And what's the gap between the 90 and the rest? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I, I, so I'll just echo again my question about like somehow including free and reduced lunch because that does seem to be the major indicator of the gap. That's where the gap is. So in, in, in our last question round of this section of our goals, I had suggested possibly framing one of the goals to include free and reduced lunch in some way as like a data collection point. And I will just reiterate that I feel, I mean, maybe Libby can speak to this. I don't know, but like when you've talked about the academic achievement gap, you said it's very predictable based on a certain factors. And one of the big factors where it's predictable is free and reduced lunch. So why aren't we naming that in one of our goals? Uh, okay. Free reduced lunch, regardless of socioeconomic status, and the demographic ones. That's what we were definitely meaning. Because I feel like maybe that's where we would pull from what Mike Barry was saying about progress instead of at grade level. You know, like maybe we say a certain percentage of a certain grade of students who are on free and reduced lunch, you know, improve by this percentage. You know what I mean? Um, so just measuring from where they're at, are they making progress instead of blending their data in with everybody else and saying 90% of them. Yeah. But if it's too challenging of a data point to pull from, you know, that's what I would want to hear if it's like, doesn't make sense to pull that data point out. Out kids who qualify for free and reduced lunch. But you have that goal inclusive and event. another goal. You know what I mean? Like not try to reword this goal. Yeah, I was. I was debating with, or I debate this with Mike all the time, because I think proficiency is a good indicator for the board, um, because. Kids need to grow at different at different rates in order to reach grade level or above standard, right? And so that becomes really complicated to at this level, which is big, right? Which is big, broad umbrella. It gets really complicated to say how do we show that? And if a third grader is reading at a end of kindergarten rate, I don't want that kid to grow a year and a half. I want that kid to grow four years, and it's going to take a long time to do that. Right, it becomes really kid kid dependent. So I personally think for a board level discussion around what our indicators are, I personally think that um, percentage or proficiency is a good thing to look at for you all. Mike will disagree with me, <laughs> which well, is going to be a yes and. Like that's a good thing to look at, and it might be, it might set some of our hearts at ease to know. Well, we've also made at least a half a year of grade. You know. I think that's our job to tell you the story on. So and we don't want to name it as an actual I, data point. I personally think the board, less is more from the board. You have way too many right now. And so less is more. And we have to tell the story. So if these are three to four year goals, then, and we're trying to get to 90% of third graders, then it might be part of the story that we say, look, this year's first graders finished the year at... I don't know, 70%. This year at the end of second grade, they're finishing the year at 85%. We're almost there. You know, like that's a growth measure. Mm -hmm. That's part of the story we need to tell you. Um, or if it's going the opposite direction, we're like, we haven't figured this out yet. We got to figure this out. Like we're we're aware of it. That's mm -hmm. all part of the data story, right? But like 
I think less is more here. So I've thrown out lots of ideas at you. I think the board has to decide which is the most important one or two that you're really looking at. Yeah. All right, so food for thought for the next small group, which will not belong in safety months. A lot of progress, but we did that's the wording of that first bullet point again that in a way that we think makes more sense so um, data is collected both quantitative and qualitative from our three main stakeholder groups students staff families caregivers with participation that word is new um, instead of putting 90 percent participation across demographics of our community and a particular effort to collect feedback from historically marginalized groups 90 percent of respondents that's a new word um, before it said stakeholders <laughs> report feeling welcome and part of our school. So we think we had buy-in from our leader on the wording of that one. Uh, we still like the absent bullet and uh, if we're going to think about two or three goals for each of these or you know is that where we should be going instead of one two three four five six seven that we're trying to finesse each one And it may be, you know, if I had to say, based on what Libby just said about ninth graders, a percentage of ninth graders indicate feeling and being attached to their school community. That's a big measure. That and the absentee, and then the, the respondents. And those are achievable, potentially. Well, yeah. that's a certain number on um, like ninth graders in the case feeling like two of them, all of them. Um, Sorry, which one? The Just what about ninth graders? Talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, also, like we did talk about, Kristen and I talked about this one. The ninety percent of students participate in some kind of co-curricular activity. And we felt like there was like an equity piece that with that, that not everybody is, you know, has the opportunity to stay after school to participate. So maybe, it, you know, I like Rhett's idea or it just seems like we should be sort of shooting for like two or three. Yeah. So the also the last one, I'm not, I don't know if that, if teachers and administrators having high expectations of our students necessarily evokes a feeling of belonging, safety, and wellness. Um, so I'm not sure that that belongs there. I feel like it was moved from academic achievement. Sorry, what? Yeah. That's but it maybe it just isn't one of our <laughs> high priority ones. Yeah. Okay. All right, we will go to share what I mean what might be belonging is, is is that like how high expectations do you like they feel that that their um teachers and administrators are invested in like their success and well-being mm -hmm. mm -hmm. like they, they care about them and pay, paying attention yeah Yep, that's an idea. All right, so then the community engagement and accountability, the draft goals we've landed on are 90% of caregivers report that their children's teachers and school community communicates with them in a way that invites collaboration and respects them as advocates and decision makers in their children's education. 75% of all community members 
report and understanding of our district's goals for student achievement. And 50% of all community members report a feeling, report feeling that they are a part of what's happening in our school community and welcome inside our buildings. So I go back to a quick Google search well, told me that, believe it or not, <laughs> but multiple sites on that Google search said that 30% was a good response rate for any survey. So how will we be able to report 90 or 95 percent oh she using the word on the site it's up for spot okay then okay well it yeah doesn't, it doesn't well, say it's that it's not worded that way right? yeah right that would be um i felt like jake had a pretty good point with it sounds like you might have some experience with collecting data but of, around um uh but also the the representative sample size thing was the thing that I sort of glommed onto. Like, what would be a representative sample size of our students? You know, and I don't know the answer to that, but maybe we can find out, and maybe that can be the goal instead of just putting numbers out there. What if you asked for? people to report on their peers yeah. on their peers. like 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 on their peers like if you asked third graders to say what proportion of your peers feel safe or something like this it's not a because reliable you, survey no but you're going to get the same 30% all the time <laughs> and maybe you you get those 30% to do the work. I don't know. I you know can't that report as a, I'll speak for my parent. I can't report what other parents in my kids' school districts feel about the school. Do you know what I mean? Like, right. Yeah. Thought, yeah. Like thinking about kids and one out of five is going to answer every survey and they could talk to their five buddies maybe, or something like this. I don't know. Um, yeah. Other thoughts on the goals, numbers that are there, how they're working. <laughs> how would we get community members? How would a survey go out to community members? Say seventy five percent of responding community members. Community members' emails. How does yeah. the survey go out to community? Front porch forum. Yeah, that will be a fabulous response. Yeah, I. Why are you I'm not sure that we have that. All of our data has to come from surveys of people self-reporting. Mm -hmm. Like I think a goal can be still be like we host five you know, listening sessions and they're attended by more than 25 people each yeah. or something like that. Like it doesn't have to always come from self-reporting surveys. I also like the idea of asking people to say whether or not we're doing a good job and then just counting the number of responses, not what they say. Because the number of yeah. responses, not, not, not the quality of the response, just the number of responses. I don't know where that would go. And it even front foot form, it could go right on the bottom of the template. How are we doing? Even the like Score summarizing. Sorry. Yeah. Just... I think also even like um summarizing meetings on front porch forum like that is a data point that can be measurable it's like we we report we provide summaries of 100 percent of our meetings on three different sources community sources you know including roxbury we just don't know what impact that has unless we hear back from right but we know that we're putting it out there yeah. i think we can measure more impact by like you know attendance at at things but I still think it's a smart measure. I th still think it's a smarty goal to say we're going to put out, you know, four newsletters 
throughout the year advertised in the bridge or however many. I get really worried about things I don't have control over. And as I think Jill said it in one board member board meeting, if people don't know what's going on, they're just not, <laughs> you know, like I can put out blogs, podcasts, what, like, and you are my listeners. Thank you. <laughs> you know, so um, it just doesn't, I don't, I get nervous about goals that I have no control over. And I have no control over um, members of our community who don't have, have kids in our school reporting an understanding of what our goal, they may not be, that may, may not be something they're put into. How it actually affects people. I mean, we can, we can plug the holes and the obvious holes, you know, I mean, you know, one one thing I think was legitimate was with the flooding in the high school. We we're doing a great job of giving information to people who had some sort of connection to the school, and very little, you know, outside. And we can we can control that, but you know, we can't control whether people click those links and read them. Um, but we, you know, we can make them. We can make the information available and make it, you know, make it broadly available and available in like multiple, you know, formats. Yeah, and then we can you know, get out and, and do a good job of announcing or hey, we, can, we can do a really good job of announcing forums. We can't drag 25 people in for each of them. I mean, a lot of that depends on, you know, see if an issue's hot, people find it. I mean, like we can do a good job of reaching out, but I mean, if everything's swimming, going swimmingly and, and people aren't up in arms, they may not give up a, a Wednesday or a Thursday night to come and talk about it. About emails that we receive and our response rate yeah. to those emails, um, uh, that each email like offers the person writing the email like some sort of resource to actually be involved beyond just emailing. So like the response can be, thank you for your thoughts and here's what we're doing. And also we're hosting this community listening session. So like there could be like, you know, 100% of emails are responded to and 100% of response responses um, include a method of engagement for that person. Um, there could be some sort of like negative data collection, like the thing that we're experiencing right now with a lot of feedback about one topic, like we could sort of start tracking that type of thing when we're hearing from the community that they are, they do feel left out of decisions and we're hearing that. So that's qualitative data that isn't like 75% of blah, 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 but it's like, yes, we have heard from our community that they feel disengaged from the track decision and they're unhappy with that right now. So now we need to work with them to make sure that they feel heard and understood and engaged in the process. So there could be something, I'm not sure. I yeah. Right, right. Which a lot of times there's zero. Yeah. I mean, so we may not like necessarily where it's heading, but at least people are engaging about what they want <laughs> in the process. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. I just think we want to be really careful about pleasing everyone. I don't. I don't think that's an appropriate goal. I think that's an unsafe goal. I think that's a dangerous goal. I think that that's a very slippery slope and takes us in the directions that we don't have any control over. Um, if people want to run for the board, they have every opportunity. Yeah, I, 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 making sure that the information and the opportunity for engagement is out there. But if people want to ignore that and then come in and call us a bunch of, of idiots, I don't think we need to stop on a dime and, and mm -hmm. necessarily accommodate each and every one of them. I think we have to be a little realistic about, you know, providing opportunities for engagement, making sure the information is out there and not just out there to the parent and caregiver community, but to the community as a whole. Uh, yeah, making sure we're, we're seeking that community input and doing it methodically and in a process oriented way, but with the, the expectation of the people that are going to ignore it and then get mad that they've, ignored it and point the finger at us and um you know that's that's gonna happen. Jake, what were you saying? Specific things is like, you know, as a recent outsider now on the board, like the things going on on Front Porch Forum, it's like terrible. It, it's social media. 
and it's it's a terrible way of gathering opinions is like it's it's efficient way to disseminate your opinion that's for sure but it's not a survey at all and it's it's not representative and you know i don't know i wouldn't put too much stock into it um if you want to be scientific and this is kind of late to be dropping this but to survey Montpelier residents, what you would do is you randomly choose from our addresses um, and mail out something. And then you'd also, I don't know if you've ever gotten this from the Gallup poll, but they put in like a dollar bill sometimes to get people to respond. But you could like enter the people into like a contest for like a free Wrightsville Reservoir Pass or something like that, you know? So then you get some responses. And you'd probably survey before you start whatever measures you're going to do, like the bridge and whatever you're planning. And then also at the end of it to see if you improved on from where you were. And that's the scientific way to probably pull that off. That sounds like fun. <laughs> it's totally legal, too. You can randomly select yeah. addresses. It does feel like some of this you know like that type of thing we might want to hire you know somebody to do that for us and not expect us no. or the district to do that yeah so i want to so we've done we've done two rounds of draft draft and revisions we've gotten feedback on where we're at so far i want to do just a, like a temperature check because it's 8 45 we have planned one more round we could power through and do that and try and, and move the needle a little further and then call it a night for that we do also have some policy monitoring due which i suppose we could table for the next meeting or we could just do it and get it done with but i wanted to see where folks are at after the end of this marathon evening at the end of a full no. I mean, I know my mind is wandering and I'm on the verge of ruling, but if others are are, are feeling. Did you say you could pull it together? Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm like an ultra marathon runner. But I, so I, I can pull it together, but I just want to be cognizant of, of the quality of our discussion moving forward. I thought it was interesting too that at the end of that last one, we were actually talking about paring them down. Yeah. That's a different approach than like, what are we missing? We need to expand. Yeah. So I what think it's it helpful to have time to think about what we did and then respond to it again at a different time. Because we've been working on this a lot. And, you know, you get your brain gets fatigued and you might do better thinking when you're fresh rethinking or whatever. I think we're approaching diminishing returns <laughs> at this point in the process and I think it makes sense to pause, not do us another round and kind of take this in. I mean, it's also just feels like it's progress, but it still feels like this needs some substantive work. And I don't know that we're gonna get that out of the third round tonight. And it makes sense to me to just move forward to policy monitoring, which probably won't take very long and be able to check that box and um, kind of bump this to the next. Yes, I appreciate that very much. And bring back the high, what the team has emphasized as what they deem to be the best indicators for the board. I almost feel a little embarrassed to put this list in front of the minister. I just ah, don't worry I about it. I put tons of students. Okay. okay. Don't worry. <laughs> fly on the wall meeting this year. Um, oh, you really don't. Okay. <laughs> I, don't I, I also want to recognize that we do this in a four hour retreat. This is not a four hour retreat. It's dealt with some really substantial stuff. Yeah. yeah. And we're tying this in and like we just keep plugging along, you know. My basic needs are not being met right now on a human level. And so I'm feeling hungry and tired and hot. And so I would prefer to wrap it up. Well, then let's wrap it up. And I just want to say what we're trying to do here is hard in good circumstances. And I just wanted to say appreciation to all of you for really, I have been hearing some very honest and thoughtful conversation happening and there's this is like the last 
well, four plus hours, but for sure the last couple of hours have been a real demonstration, I think, of how invested each one of you is in the excellence of our school. So when you yeah. create job structure, yeah. you would not accomplish this without that. Yeah, no, it's, absolutely. It's a really an honor to work with all of you. No, thank you. And, and a big call out to Mia for um, putting an important structure on it. We made, we, I mean, we made a ton of progress. And um, mm -hmm. it really created a, a great structure for us to do that. And, and I think, yeah, I mean, we can definitely, I think, run it by the, even though it's imperfect, I think getting the thoughts of the administrator. I mean, if for no other reason than just, I mean, is our course correction three degrees? Is it 30 degrees? Just yeah. so we can get some of that feedback. I appreciate that very much. Um, and then I think it, you know, we could even add time to another meeting, like maybe do a 5.30 start or something and get some of this um, this, this done. Um, yeah, no, and, and huge thank you to me and, and thank you to everyone because we have made, we've made a ton of progress from where we were when we started and then you know obviously uh the flooding kind of threw our schedule out for the summer and has given us a lot of other things to chew on so there's a lot of a lot of brain space that's been taken up um so uh why don't we go to, to policy monitoring um and see if we can approve that quickly and then go home and um get some food and sleep uh, we do have a motion to approve the two policy monitoring reports. We have FM 101 budget policy uh, and B1 substitute teachers. So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? I have a, just a quick question about the substitute teachers and, and training. So did substitute teachers receive any training on like emergency protocol response type stuff or is it mostly limited to I think it's, it was act one and kind of okay they all receive a uh, folder with yeah. emergency plans in it okay so they receive that upon coming in yeah that they're expected to read yeah okay they do not get active shooter training which sure. I think is what you're getting yeah. at okay I just had one yep. comment which is for the for both of them um the title is correct and all of the content is correct except for the opening paragraph says this is my modern report on policy a1 oh, for geez. conflict of interest so that. just a I, oh, geez, I didn't just type all that <laughs> yeah. um so your catch me uh i'll just at least on the links that i'm clicking yeah, they're in the same document, right? Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah. yeah, they were in the same. Got it. So, just I requesting you know, that change so that it's all uh, consistent. Yeah, matches. So, with that, I would be happy to vote. So, um, with those, I don't think we need a new motion for typos. Um, with those. Corrections, uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? And uh, I think the motion to adjourn is our final yeah. act. Just based on the feedback from a community member who couldn't hear well in the audience, I'd like to recommend that we all get Mission Impossible earpieces. But, and you know, so, 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 and yeah, so that our voice is projected both to Orca and because this doesn't really apparently work and it doesn't project into the room. Right. No, this works for the. This the, might work a lot better than, that. right, sure. Zoom. Yeah. And we also, That's for like, Zoom, not for Orca. Yeah. We have to use the challenge. Yeah. It's cool. Yeah. It's not, not for participants sitting there. Uh, together. Motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.